important. And uh, I, I know that Don met Max Spears. Uh, I'm assuming yeah. Randy might have a, at, at one point maybe even interviewed. No, oh, okay. I was uh, I was blocked from having contact with any of the, that group and you. <laughs> you remember when I told you that, right? Uh, I was- I- I, I remember briefly, actually, to tell you the truth, it, it, there was so much going on uh, with so many things I was dealing with that I do remember very vaguely Randy Maugans, and I knew he had a program, uh, and I, I, it was only Ra- Ramona Halitha Henry who just reminded myself that, uh, it, that, that as apparently we've ha- ter- peripherally had some kind of contact. And it must yeah, have been, we did. Yeah, and it, it was, uh, I was trying to dredge that out of the uh, attic of my my adult brain and uh no i have the i have the initial contacts you sent me your phone number and what happened was that lorian fenton got in the middle of it Uh, she wouldn't let me buy your book i went to buy your book Uh and lorian fenton sent my paypal back and said no you can't fucking buy this book how bizarre. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not surprising. It, it, it's it's not surprising at all. And, of course, uh, I've, I've gone into the background behind that. We may as well do it now. Uh, it basically, L- Lorian Ann Fenton was uh, someone who was obviously involved in some way or another with Michael Aquino. The first time that I had met her, though, was at a period of time when I couldn't avoid these kinds of contacts. So I'm happy to speak about that now with yourself. As a matter of fact, uh, part of the uh, horror of the situation with alternative media, and uh, this will take us ultimately to QAnon when we do speak of it in the near future, but what I, the yeah, reason that okay. I would like to put QAnon off as the major topic for now is simply because I can't do it justice without looking into the background. No, about I understand the, that. Yeah, I the, no, I don't want you to do that. Yeah, yeah. You, you're, you know, I, I know you like to be fully briefed and on point with that, so right. not a problem. And I appreciate that. But definitely, to give people a prelude to that, or a precursor, uh, when someone becomes a public informant like myself, the biggest problem that many people don't understand is the fact that uh, you find it almost impossible uh, to independently speak to the public. And the reason yeah. for that is much of alternative media is very co-opted. And a lot of this yes. has to do yes. yeah, a lot of this has to do with the desperation of many of the people involved. So I'll try and outline that for, for everyone. Uh, in a case like uh, when I first uh, started uh, out to appear at conferences, and we have to give credit where credit is due. Lorian Ann Fenton had a agenda, and her agenda was basically to follow a instructions uh, to the point where she her job was basically to drain me of all of the finances that I had, and to do so, uh, she did it in a way to uh, that that would of course at the same time look as if it were serving my purpose, which was as a public mm. informant to circulate as widely as possible. So what Lorian Ann Fenton did was she began to amalgamate my uh, purpose, which was to expose things that I had seen as a documents destruction uh, specialist, as a uh, research dog librarian. Just went out the window. Yeah. Yes. And so the uh, when uh, I was busy trying to expose that, what she did was she uh, immediately conflate it and confuse the issue. And this is not necessarily a negative in the long run with many other topics. And some of those topics were, of course, uh, ufology, and some of that was the super soldier phenomenon. And uh, so all of that ultimately um, was beneficial in the sense that with all the conferences she was setting up to basically juice all of my finances that she could, uh, what she was doing was instead of just having Douglas Dietrich present something, she made the expenses astronomically orders of magnitude more extreme by turning it into an entire conference and bringing other people in. So my money was being used to pay for the hotel rooms for everyone and the transportation and everything else. Wow. So, uh, but through that, I met Don Ham Hart and uh, a number of other people and Max Spears and uh, and that includes people who I had ultimately negative experiences with in a sense such as James Casbolt <laughs> slash Michael Prince, uh, but, but at the same yeah, yeah, yes yeah. yes and at the same time I met his. Uh, 
uh, wife, of course, Haley Mayer at the time she was his wife. And so uh, through her and uh, Max and Sarah Rachel Adams, uh, I got to know them very well, that crowd. And, uh, of course, uh, their son won't remember me at all. Rather, Haley Mayer's son won't remember me at all. He was uh, only about two years old at the time. Yes, and, uh, well, he was a baby, yeah, when I first met him. That's right. It was amazing that I, I knew these period people for a period of several years and kind of watched uh, certain people grow and certain people degenerate. So it, she, she kind of had her benefits. And um, the, the, um, but the negative aspect of it was that she always, of course, had her ulterior motives. And um, those were very much part of what would be the Aquino uh, agenda. And uh, Mr. Aquino, who, of course, was known by Max Spears, who, of course, was known by James Casbolt slash Michael Prince and had victimized both of them, uh, along with a number of other people that we know, such as uh, Christine Joanna Hart, who's gone on record about that. Uh, the important thing to remember was that through his network of victims, and, and it's always important to remember that no matter what kind of uh, relationship that I might develop with these people, such as the positive relationship that happened with Max, the negative uh, mm -hmm. that happened with James. It's important to remember that these are all victims of Michael Aquino. And yeah. uh, when uh, Christine Joanna Hart and I broke off sure. communications, it was because, of course, it was obvious to me she was still being victimized by Michael Aquino. And I'll happily go into those directions if you want to ask for more details, and I'll certainly give you my impression of what's going on with all of these people and what, or what happened with them while they were alive. But uh, in terms of Lorian Ann Fenton, who is still alive and still with us as far as I can ascertain, what she did was, as I said, and at the same time she seemed connected with people who were obviously very for lack of a better word, mind-controlled. A uh, great example of that was uh, Doug Millar. And uh, Doug Millar was an individual who um, was passing out pamphlets about myself at these various conferences. Uh, they were very negative. Uh, they were saying that I was uh, very much a defender of Aquino, that I was an ally of his. The interesting thing about Doug Millar was that he was doing this before I was really a public informant. So when I saw him at these conferences where I was just introducing myself, it was obvious that he had foreknowledge I was going to do this. And so when I saw him in a football huddle with Lorian and Fenton, I knew they were affiliated. But at the same time, I really had access to no one else that would get me exposed at all. It's not like I really had a choice. And to give you an example of how this is, one of my early affiliates, uh, again, someone I had no choice but to affiliate with because I'm trying to get the word out as fast as possible and uh, as quickly as possible because the more exposure I got, the, the quicker, the more likely it was that I would survive uh, to a more stable position. So when I originally was approached by an individual named Olav Phillips, he was very suspect to me from the beginning. He was essentially a groupie with admin privileges, the quote-unquote executive producer for Clyde Lewis. And uh, that is the um, man who ultimately did Ground Zero Radio. And um, this is an individual who, of course, uh, was originally, you would think, a benign figure. He was the voice for the Toxic Avenger in the original film. Uh, and this was an individual who, of course, had his uh, obvious uh, leanings. Uh, it turned out he was very much a uh, follower of Rex Diabolus, uh, the Satanist who went so far as to have horns uh, implanted in his forehead surgically. And uh, this individual was, of course, deeply involved with Olaf Phillips in what was a romantic relationship. And Olaf Phillips was what we called in San Francisco. He was a homosexual individual who had a beard. That's the term that's used in the San Francisco gay community for a homosexual who marries woman. a woman yeah. to look straight. Yeah. And exactly. uh, so he was married, but his, his real love was Clyde Lewis. And uh, again, I could go into great detail about this. I got to know painfully all too much about these individuals while I was working with them. And this became kind of like the normative pattern was basically Clyde Lewis with his interviews with myself would uh, get fabulous ratings. And at the time, Clyde Lewis was not syndicated. He was someone who was just uh, bucking for syndication. 
And the ratings that he got with myself were so extraordinarily high that what happened was that he became nationally syndicated after his interview with myself. And, and people who look this up, the dates that everything happened, will verify that. And uh, what happened was he took the place of uh, a political uh, spokesperson or, or, or just a pundit who was on uh, one of the um, shows for Premier Radio Network, which, of course, was the same show, the same network that carries Coast to Coast AM. So he made this kind of nationwide splash with myself and then uh, after he was established and got nationally syndicated then of course they uh, cut all contacts with myself and basically cut all ties this was a normative this is what happened with uh, of course uh, uh, the individual who worked with Coast to Coast and interviewed me on Coast to Coast more than George Norrie did which was John B. Wells and John B. Wells got far higher ratings because he was interviewing myself on the weekends then George Norrie was getting, and ultimately George Norrie had him fired because of that. This is what John B. Wells expected, and he told me, uh, you know, because I'm interviewing you, I'm getting the higher ratings than George Norrie. Um, all of this is probably going to get me fired, and I'm going to have to start a show of my own. So he was setting up a lifeboat at the time, and then based on, again, the ratings he got with myself, he had enough of a following to establish his own show, and once he did that, he refused to have me on uh, when he had me on just once. It might have been twice, but he had me on maybe once. It was after a great deal of uh, uh, basically argumentation, uh, saying that he owes me that Did you that remember that I just, uh, my Skype just dropped out and crashed? I, 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 I saw that. i um, hoping we're still recording. I, I saw that your no, camera actually, dropped. actually, we're not recording. I never okay. started the recording. I had no oh. idea you were going to launch into this. Oh, okay. I can I can. Re- I can restart it all. That's fine. Uh, okay, I, I, let's let's, let's sure. do this. Yeah. Let me talk us into the show. Sure. So so that we have, we have a ground basis. Sounds uh, good. <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna do a brief bio sketch. You can fill that in, and maybe we can just like I never assume that an audience knows a guest, although you're well known. So we spend maybe five minutes popping in. Um, just some background on you and the Presidio and um, your um, connections to, I don't know, do you want to talk about Aquino or? I, I, Whatever you want what? to talk about. The, on, the only I, thing I said was QAnon, I was just leery of because I, I want to do it justice because it's cool. an immense yeah, no, subject. I understand that. Why, yeah. why don't you talk about what you told me, Douglas, about your whole background with Aquino, how you were the librarian and your experiences yeah, that sure. you had? Because those were damn interesting. <laughs> Let's just go from there. I'll pull you. We'll, we'll pull into some interesting stuff along the way. Sure. So uh, let me do this. <clears throat> Let's pray this software works because I just had to install an update on it and I didn't have a chance to test it. So, take your time. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the Zoom. It's just Rex Bear of Leak Project. What happened was I think he's got like uh, a stock in Zoom or something because he was pushing that like it was uh, like like it was the next best thing to slice bread or something. And then what happened was he was telling me how easy it was and how we were going to get on Zoom and he gave me. What I needed to push, and then what happened was the biggest nightmare I ever experienced in my life. Oh, and, I'm sorry and, about oh that. God, it was awful. It- <laughs> okay, that's what I mean. I, I I told Don what I did was I installed the the updates to Skype. I usually use a Mac. We're on my Windows computer because first off, it's hard, it's hardwired Ethernet, mm-hmm. so I'm not at the vagaries of Wi-Fi, and so I had to update all this software bullshit before I could use it on my Windows computer. Sure. So. Let's do this. Let's let's just go ahead and record and hope that the gods of technology are with us. Yeah. <clears throat> That's all we can do. And I'll let you guide. You take over, lead the dance. Cool. Awesome, okay. brother. All right, here we go in three, two, one. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I don't think this will be TV for this show. But you do get the voices, and that's what counts. The website is offplanetradio.com, and um, you might want to go over to our supporter website, which is the Patreon site, because that's where you're going to get the second hour of the shows. Uh, We have group meetups, and um, there's other things that we're dropping into the mix there. But ultimately, it's just a way to support us if you want to do so. Otherwise, you get the free stuff. Cool. Anyway got an exciting show for you tonight and we've got a guest who's uh coming in 
and we're going to hit on some pretty wild and wide scoping topics because, well, let me tell you about him. He is the son of a retired U.S. Navy sailor who worked for 10 years at the Department of Defense Research as a librarian in the Presidio military base of San Francisco. One of his major duties was document destruction, of course, and he then experienced the 1991 Kuwait campaign serving in Desert Storm as a United States Marine. He has an amazing background. He has an amazing story, and uh, he can regale you literally with just density of history. It's magnificent. We welcome Douglas Dietrich to Our Planet Radio. Hello, my brother. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Randy, especially um, after our inability to communicate years ago. I'm glad that we're finally, after all this time, able to make contact with yourself and your audience. Yes, it is. And um, in the background is our friend Dawn. She's sitting in. Yes. And she kind of, she kind of um, was, she's the producer, actually. We always, the person who sets up interviews is executive producer, so Dawn Hart is our executive producer for the show. Emily is in California somewhere. She couldn't be here for this interview. So uh, we miss Emily, and we welcome Dawn. And, Doug, before we get started, um, I gave a sketch background there, which is kind of a brief bio that I actually stole off Coast to Coast website. So forgive me for that, but um, that was my show prep. Anything you want to add to that? How did you... so? Maybe give us a little bit of your life journey, because you were born on the island of Samoa, is that correct? Uh, No, uh, uh, Taiwan. But uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, of course, I want to thank Dawn Hamhart for being here, because she's such a comforting presence. I've met her uh, more than a few times, and uh, she's an angel, and I want people to know how much she helps people. And if it weren't for her, many of the people who I've met at conferences where I've met her that were set up by my former manager, Lorian Ann Fenton, who will have to inescapable cover a bit tonight in terms of my backstory. Uh, yeah. That's probably one of the more positive things to come out of that experience was having met Dawn Hamhart and people like her, the real positive people in the world who make a difference. And one of the ways that she's done that is making this possible. So let's, you know, uh, our, our friend Randy Malkins is dead on. Uh, we do miss Emily, but uh, Dawn is, uh, she's uh, really with us tonight. She's filling in the feminine presence. Tonight. Yes, and without yeah, her, we so would be much the poorer. And, Drowning um, in our testosterone, as it were. Yes, poor dear. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, uh, like I said, I'd, I'd just kind of give us a little bit of background sketch about how you got to where you are today, whatever bio and you want it. Sure, how I wound up here us. from uh, the middle of the yeah. Pacific, right? The, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, the, the important thing to say without overdwelling on it, because I can get lost in a lot of pedantic details and historicity, what I am counting on is Randy to basically uh, lead the way. And he'll lead the dance, and whenever uh, he wants to turn the topic, I invite him to do so with all the force he feels necessary. <laughs> yeah. I do a snappy uh, fox job. Yeah, and uh, so, so basically... Uh, The island of Formosa is a very uh, specific place with a very rarefied situation uh, that needs to be appreciated. Uh, It is not recognized by the United Nations and is considered a rogue state or a renegade regime. Uh, It's actually considered a renegade territory of the United States because the United States placed it under USMG or United States military government in approximately 1945. Uh, So it would be viewed as if Puerto Rico had declared... uh, secession from American territorial status, whereas uh, the People's Republic of China or the Communist Chinese on the mainland declare it to be a renegade province. So both of these superpowers claim uh, direct ownership, so to speak, of the island on which I was born. Neither has been able to invade it and uh, and, and basically manifest their claims into any sense of reality. Uh, so nevertheless,
last time one was one of the founding member states of the United Nations, which no longer recognizes it. So the situation has literally stood on its head. And how this came to happen would take 18 hours worth of college course lecture to explain to everyone the incredible politics behind that. So suffice to say, it is a state which is a pariah nation state. Nevertheless, it's one of the most technologically advanced nation states in the world and uh, one of the largest economies, an economy which was orders of magnitude larger than mainland China's uh, with a billion people on it uh, for many decades until fairly recently uh, where communist China overtook its economy by sheer size. So uh, this is literally kind of like a comic book villain's uh, nation state where you have the combination of high technology and non-recognition, something like Dr. Doom's Latvia or Wakanda uh, for people to get a grasp of exactly where I was born. Uh, so I I am a uh, national of that nation state, uh, meaning the Nationalist Chinese Republic on the island of Taiwan. Uh, it's only recently that people began to give, develop even the concept of someone being Taiwanese, because for many decades, many generations grew up with the concept of it as Nationalist Chinese who happened exactly. to live on. I grew up in the yeah. era when we were taught that yeah. in the history books, referential to... Um, Chiang Kai-shek, I Thank believe, you. as the leader at that time. That's correct. Yeah, and for, for many decades. As a matter of fact, the fact that you remember that is incredible to me because I would never guess that Randy was that old. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, I dated myself. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. and uh, so uh, and I wound up uh, when we were when I was uh, fairly young. We moved to the United States, but it's important to remember that I was still very acculturated. And the reason that this was the case was I was never very acculturated into American culture. Uh, there were several reasons for that, uh, and uh, the without getting too deeply into that, there were a lot of dynamics concerning uh, Chinese enclaving and uh, what it's known as ethnic enclaving and many ethnicities do this they ghettoize they they ethnically enclave so the language stuck with me but it was mostly because of my mother and uh, her ability to force me to learn the language uh, to learn much of the uh, culture even though we were in a foreign nation now I didn't come here when I was that young but we came here I was born in 1966 in uh, the island of Taiwan known as island China at the time or free China and uh, when we came here, uh, basically it was about uh, 1969. Uh, so I was about uh, about uh, th two, three years of age, actually about three-ish. And uh, horrible things took place in upstate New York where my father initially attempted to relocate us. So then he took us to San Francisco as far away uh, from one end of the continent to the other as he could get from upstate New York where all of my European relations live, my father's side of the family, the uh, European-American or Caucasian side. And mm -hmm. he came to San Francisco because that was his uh, stomping grounds when he was on leave from the U.S. Navy because it was a major port for many years because the Presidio military base, yes. the uh, Treasure Island Naval Base, uh, the o the uh, Alameda Naval Station. So San Francisco had a very heavy military presence. So he was very familiar with San Francisco, and so that's why he moved us here. And when I grew up here, uh, I was very exposed to the Native American phenomena because, of course, I, I do have Native American blood in myself enough to be considered legally by what used to be the Bureau of Indian Affairs to be a Native American, which is one eighth blood. Mm -hmm. And at that period of time that we came here, which was uh, we spent a year in upstate New York, and then when we came here to San Francisco, uh, we came here on the very date that the airport was shut down in emergency lockdown because a terrorist incident had happened, a major terrorist incident, one that uh, in this day and age would make world headlines, as it did then. And what happened was the Native Americans had occupied uh, tra they had occupied Alcatraz Island. Yes, and so, this was uh, aim under Russell Means. It, that that was believe. one of the organizations that yes. was uh, claiming that was claiming uh, the responsibility. And yes. um, and and I know that Randy, just by what he said, he's very familiar with the situation. Uh, so it's important to remember that uh, we all have narratives based on the information that we get from from exactly. different sources. And and in yes. my case. 
one of the um, uh, the organizations that seemed primarily responsible for it at the time that I grew up more familiar with, and a lot of this could be regionalism in San Francisco, was the IAT, or the Indians of All Tribes. And okay. that was run by, of course, uh, the the, uh, the Mohawk, who was known as uh, the uh, Joe the Mohawk. And uh, he was, of course, an iron worker. And uh, he was someone who uh, was uh, taking over the island he became the primary villain of the day uh richard oaks and of course people mm-hmm. were just calling him injun joe at the time and um so he ultimately died violently it was it was a terrible situation but it was it was it was traumatic enough where i remembered it at that very young age and of course because i was identified as a native american based on appearances by many people uh many people would ask me about it as i was growing up so so these things were going on as, as part of my background and then what happened was as uh, I was basically entering uh, adolescence and entering my teen years uh, what decisively happened was a number of things I had 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 fairly negative experiences in fact downright awful just just awful experiences with public school uh, I was in middle school at the time when they were getting rid of junior high school. So we lost a year of education uh, because they were converting junior high schools into middle schools. Middle and, schools, yeah. Yeah, and at that period of time, I was going to Marina, which was, uh, like so many of the other schools I went to, simply because San Francisco is what it is, predominantly Asian Pacific Islander uh, mm-hmm. population and, and student body. And I wanted to avoid that. I wanted something different from many of the Asian Pacific Islanders I was growing up surrounded with, so I uh, went into a trade school, and that was John O'Connell Vocational Institute. Now, that's not the John O'Connell Vocational Institute, which stands today in San Francisco in a totally different area of San Francisco. The original John O'Connell Vocational Institute was at uh, Treat Street and Bryant Street, and it was in a very dangerous area of the uh, Latin American barrio uh, in uh, San Francisco, and uh, it was known as San Quentin Prep. Now, it really wasn't a aware of that at the time. I was aware of its history as basically a uh, what was then an all-Irish majority uh, mission district, and uh, the history of it was what I was familiar with, and I went there to learn electronics. Uh, well, that turned out to be one of the biggest uh, life-changing experiences. Uh, it was there I found out, of course, it was no longer an Irish uh, majority neighborhood. It was no longer an Irish majority student body. It was Latin Americans, and the situation was entirely different. And I uh, had to familiarize myself with the barrio gang mentality uh, immediately. And one of the other things that happened was I met a secretary there who had lost her job as the quote-unquote lap secretary or the unofficial secretary to the mayor of San Francisco, George Moscone. Moscone. And Moscone was shot. He was killed. She was actually in the office at the time that he was shot and killed. And uh, she was pushed down to the ground bodily by a Mr. Dan White, who was carrying a firearm, walking into City Hall. And 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 when he just walked into City Hall in those days carrying an open firearm, he uh, pushed her to the ground and uh, got past her and got to the office where Moscone was talking to Dan, to um, what was known as the mayor of Castro Street. And uh, that was, um, oh, God, his name escapes me at the moment. Uh, and, of course, he was portrayed uh, by an actor in a film. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember his name. It's just, I'm just totally blanking out. But Dan White shot George Moscone and... And he shot, uh, oh, God, can somebody help me here? But he shot. You're not talking about Harvey Milk. Harvey Milk, thank you. I couldn't have gotten that out without you. And I've done a lot to purge my mind of him. Uh, this yeah. is all history I'm somewhat familiar with, but keep going. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is yeah. And 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 so he shot Harvey Milk, the man who was known as the Mayor of Castro Street. And I mm-hmm. and and so often I have these names that I've I've had a successful time purging. And of course, Harvey Milk has been exposed over the years as someone who uh, legally would be defined as a pedophile, and uh, that he has a stamp that's in his honor uh, issued yeah, by the U.S. Post a, Office. And yeah, yeah, icon. Yeah, he's an icon. And at the same time, he's no hero. He's actually a villain. And uh, but nevertheless, these two people were killed by Dan White, who never spent a day in jail. And uh, they, there was this trial that was held. 
uh, Dan White got off in what was known as the Twinkie defense. So the reason I bring this yes. up is, is, yeah, is, is, is not to cover. A lot of people don't remember this, and you're just flashing me back on this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason I bring this up is not to get people lost in San Francisco history because it seems like a tangent. It's very important to the super soldier phenomena because Dan mm -hmm. White was, as I later concluded, uh, decades later, just through all the experience that I gained with this whole phenomena, and much of this was gained, I have to say, uh, there was the experience I had with uh, Michael Aquino, the Presidio military base, the super soldiers I never personally met in the context that I would appreciate them until the conferences were established by Laurie and Ann Fenton. So it was at that period of time that I met our uh, dear friend Don Ham Hart that I was meeting many of these super soldiers and I was beginning to appreciate the true damage or the extent of the damage beyond even what I saw and knew of by Michael Aquino. And, uh, and it was in that context later on by comparing notes with all of these different people that I realized Dan White was a product of this kind of mind program, almost certainly was yeah. a product of Michael Aquino's mind control program because of San Francisco being the location, because of everything else. And Dan White uh, was therefore kind of defended. He was protected, got off on this ridiculous defense where he ate too many Twinkies and just had a sugar jag that caused him to kill the mayor of San Francisco and make um, this Jewess, uh, this very wealthy uh, Jewish woman who was never elected as mayor, made her the mayoress instantly by right of secession. And so she uh, had her career launch. We would not have Dianne Feinstein in government today as a senator in the Democratic Party being this in in incredible force without the assassination of George Moscone. And so she came into power by that. So she was obviously set into power by Michael Aquino. So we know he has his reach into many political parties, uh, both of them essentially. And uh, she was, of course, has her own controversies that are very difficult to track down and vet. Now, yet at the same time, people can see the smoke and conclude there's probably fire there. She does have uh, controversial attachments to the fact that she was involved with the uh, Guiana a cult of Jim Jones that ultimately established itself in, in Jonestown where you had the Temple Massacre. Uh, the other person involved with that uh, very heavily was, of course, the African-American Willie Brown who became mayor of San Francisco. Uh, the, the cult connections with a mass murderous cult with these politicians was because Jim Jones was himself essentially a politician. He was an advocate of what he called apocalyptic socialism. You have all of these bizarre connections, but what really dams Diane Feinstein in a way that's entirely incontrovertible was her protection of the Night Stalker, uh, Richard Ramirez. And what happened was Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, was killing people throughout California, and he had a very specific uh, fingerprinted set of uh, trace traceable firearms he was using. He was this close to being caught because of the traceability of the ammunition he was using to his firearms when uh, Diane Feinstein made it a point to get on public television and tell Richard Ramirez outright his firearms were being traced. And therefore, he changed his firearms uh, application completely, the types of firearms he was deploying, to evade that. So thanks to her, he was able to continue his killing spree. So why did she do this? Well, of course, it turned out that uh, Richard Ramirez was a product of Michael Aquino. Well, I knew that, of course, when I began to liaise with Michael Aquino. And suddenly, all these politics made sense. Uh, as a matter of fact, I met an individual who was a master sergeant of the United States Army's Special Forces Green Berets, just as Michael Aquino was an officer in the Special Forces Green Berets. And then you realize it isn't John Wayne at all. These are murderous, psychotic peoples and uh, practicing Satanists. And in the sense of Master Sergeant Michael Ramirez, when I met him at the Presidio, he was going to Letterman Army Medical Center for methadone treatments, which he could get while he was in San Francisco, just as he could get them from Veterans Administration when he was in Los Angeles. Well, he would come into the Presidio Military Base Library and he would have a shoebox full of memories of photographs of young Vietnamese girls who he would rape uh, while he was murdering them. Uh, he would force them uh, to provide him oral sex while he was having a gun pointed to their heads. And he would take what we would in pornography call POV or point of view shots of themselves mm -hmm. giving him mm -hmm. a blowjob while he had a gun pointed to his head. Then the next photographs would show that he had beheaded 
committed them, uh, various other atrocities he committed to them, various desecrations. So these were snuff films. It, well, these were photographs he had, and he didn't take films, he took photographs. And what okay. we would uh, uh, basically these days consider damning evidence for war crimes, but remember, it wasn't a legally declared war. So uh, this was one of the reasons why Richard Nixon had to pardon uh, the idiot who was responsible for the My Lai Massacre, uh, again, whose name escapes me, but, that, but right. our younger listeners can look up My Lai Massacre, M-A-I-L-A-I Massacre. Uh, that, this name's, uh, that yeah. name sits on the back end of my memory somewhere, but boy, do I remember that. Yes, yeah. and, and Richard Nixon, of course, stepped in to pardon the individual who was condemned for that, and uh, Lieutenant Callie, James Callie, and James, the yes. reason that he had to do that was because if he didn't do that, that would have opened the floodgates for other uh, American servicemen to be tried of war crimes in Vietnam, and that would have brought out the horror of individuals like Master Sergeant Michael Ramirez. Now, it was in my preventing Master Sergeant Michael Ramirez from going into the children's room, because, of course, at the Presidio Military Base Library, where I worked as a Department of Defense Research Librarian, uh, we had a children's room, of all things. And, uh, and, and of course, that was open to all the predators. And uh, one of the things, when I was on shift or on duty in the daytime, I would always uh, make certain to conscientiously prevent, was to prevent men like Michael Ramirez from going into the children's Room. Now, theoretically, that would have been taken care of by the old biddies. We called them the Carnegie ladies, and these were elderly ladies who were federal employees who you could not fire, and uh, they couldn't do anything. Uh, the majority of them had Parkinson's disease. They couldn't enter data. They couldn't type. They couldn't keyboard. Uh, <laughs> they, they, so they just hung around until they essentially died and uh, or, or actually had a retirement that couldn't be evaded. And uh, what we did do with them was we had them read children's stories stories to the children in the children's room, but they were far too intimidated by men like Master Sergeant Michael Ramirez to protect the children from him. Uh, now, he would go in there and try to literally molest or grope or, or, or rape the children. And uh, but people would uh, sh take his shoebox full of memories, his photographs. And they would take it, you know, other GIs and uh, men off duty or retirees. They would take his photographs into the bathroom and basically masturbate. Uh, so he had this thing going on where everybody was aware of what he was what he had done in Vietnam, and that was his kind of reputation in capital and trade. Now, at some point, unavoidably, I had to speak to this man several times to prevent him from going to the children's room. I would engage him in conversation, bring him to the front desk, sit him down. I found out he was on his methadone treatments, and I found out ultimately, of course, by interrogating him in this manner, asking him about uh, how he got free. Why, why wasn't he in prison? Because obviously he had been sentenced to methadone treatment. It wasn't something he was voluntarily doing. And he said, oh, well, the judge sentenced me because I was a veteran, a Green Beret, and I had done service in Vietnam. But he gave me this light sentence of, the, you know, the methadone treatment. I said, well, what did you do? Because uh, it turned out, of course, he had murdered his wife. And, and I said, well, most guys who get murdered actually, who are military men, get away with it. How did you even get caught? Uh, because most of the guys I knew who had killed their wives uh, they never, never even made it to trial. And so he said, oh, I did it in front of a witness. And I said, well, who was the witness? Well, it turned out that was his nephew, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. And it turned out he had killed his wife under orders. And it turned out he had killed her under orders so that he could do that in front of his nephew in order to create a primal trauma with many other things that Richard Ramirez suffered and all of this was done to create the Night Stalker, to create a serial killer. All of this was done in the same way that Aquino boasted to myself that he had created the Zodiac Killer. Now, the Zodiac Killer uh, was going all over San Francisco, uh, murdering women who he was claiming would be his sex slaves in the afterlife. And he uh, was, of course, never caught, uh, despite the fact of murdering well over a dozen women. And uh, he had almost murdered a pregnant woman at one time, and the only thing that stopped him was witnesses began to scream and were able to... Now, because of this, there were eyewitnesses, two of them. People had seen him, and because people had seen him, uh, everyone knew he did his killings in a military uniform. He was wearing camouflage. His footprints left in the ground at the murder sites were GI issue combat boot footprints. So this was like a soldier off-duty who was basically going around and uh, basically killing people 
under orders. Now, you, you might ask yourself, why are these people doing this? Why, why all this military connection? Well, Michael Aquino was saying that to create a state of fear, of, of constant fear in the population at home would always generate the feeling of insecurity that they needed a larger military because they irrationally would not translate that fear as a civil issue. They would irrationally always translate it as a greater issue where only the greatest amount of power could protect them, which they took materially. Uh, since they couldn't have God appear before them, they took it, uh, the father figure to be the U.S. military. And the military connection would only magnify that, that the military connection made people want even more a greater military, even though it's only producing more people like this. So this was the, the, the cycle of violence, of like familial abuse that would create the kind of people that uh, are products of a traumatized, dysfunctional family. And that's what your relation in the United States as a population has become with the U.S. military. It's become this dysfunctional relation with the father figure whom everyone reveres, dares not question. When somebody speaks against the military, then they're automatically considered a pariah. And this was the biggest problem I had uh, with some of my latest interviews. And I'm not going to bring up any names unless you ask. If you ask, I'll be happy to bring them up. But one example was one individual who interviewed me last and everything went to hell in a handbasket because he was using Zoom, which it, it, it totally dysfunctioned at the time and uh, didn't function at all and uh, wound up where he got dropped off, of all things. And he was pushing all the Zoom <laughs> like, he, like, like he had right. stock in it. And he got dropped off, and I was the only one recording. And, of course, he didn't want to put that up, so he never published it. It was just awful. People People who saw it know that it happened uh, live, but, uh, you know, he never released it onto the Internet. What, what a jerk. But at any rate, one of the things he did as a, uh, I guess I'd call it a qualifier or a disclaimer, what, what he stated at the beginning of the interview was he went into this long diatribe about, uh, uh, I don't want Douglas to say anything about Aquino. I don't want him hating on the military. I don't want him saying anything negative about, it. you know, but by the way, basically he said he didn't want me to talk about anything. And, uh, and one of the things he brought up was his brother serving in the military. And he said, I've got family yeah. in the military and yeah. my brother's in the military. And then he, then he said, oh, and by the way, you know, and my brother was in Afghanistan and he served in Afghanistan. And, and since he's come home, he's told me he's convinced he's going to go to hell and that he's damned and he's going to go to hell. And I'm like thinking to myself, well, doesn't that just say it all? I mean, it, it doesn't. Isn't this guy just reinforcing everything uh, that, that I would say? And, and I could go into depth about why. So, yeah. You know, let me, let me just park you there for a second, because this is something I don't talk about it too much, but. America has a Stockholm syndrome mentality with its military. Yes, thank I, you. I don't. I, I, I am. I am. I, I've battled this for years. I'm outspoken. I grew up during the late period of the Vietnam War as a little kid. Yeah. I was already hardened in my heart against war by the time I was probably ten years old. Yeah. I have spent my life vowing I would never be a part of the military. I had members of my family that were military, including my father who served in Korea, my brother who served in um, uh, the Middle East, mm -hmm. and other family members. And my position about the military is largely this. Cut it down to the place where it serves to protect the shores of this country, bring it back inland, shrink it down some more, because it's not supposed to be sitting with hundreds of bases overseas overseeing NATO and all these other foreign actors. Thank the you. Theater. Thank you so much. I mean, we are shoulder to shoulder. Exactly. Yep. Everything I've been saying. And please go on and, 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 and continue. Tell me about <laughs> the damage screen. it did That's to your relations. Is. Tell me about the damage it did to your relations. What, how they came well, my out. Brother, my brother, uh, I can say that my brother has severe PTSD and has been, you know, unfortunately suffering for that from many years as a result of his time spent in, um, I think he was in, what was the excursion that we had um, under, man, I can't remember now. Mm -hmm. Don't uh, worry about it, I'm always there too. I, I mean, I take all the drugs I can to, 
<laughs> to forget. Uh, so, it, you know, when, when people hear me, and I'm on, on that same cusp of, of recalling something. Uh, don't hold it against Randy or I. I mean, we've, we've done all the drinking we could to get to this point for a reason. So, <laughs> um, uh, but, but whatever excursion he was involved in under whichever president, he never came back the same. And, no, he did not. Yeah, no, he did not. And, and and just to clarify this for people, uh, and in terms of the bases that we have all over the world, and a lot of people don't understand this, and of course, uh, we don't want to get too deep into it because people can look this up themselves and and see that the United States basically occupies to an extent every nation on earth. And one of the few places it doesn't have Pretty a base. Much. Yeah, and one of the few places it doesn't have a base uh, would be my native uh, Formosa or Taiwan. Uh, but mm. uh, definitely, uh, one of the reasons they have these bases is because they are convenient places to commit crimes and uh, the abuse of children where you're out of the scope of American law or law enforcement. There's no enforcement there other than, quote-unquote, military law. And military law is not what people think. It's not enforced the way people think. And uh, obviously, certainly, there's no repercussions for men who commit war crimes, such as uh, Lieutenant Calley, uh, because, as you can see, Lieutenant Calley never spent, really, a day in jail. Uh, okay, you just said that. Let me just pop this in my sure. brother was in bosnia okay thank you and, thank you and and there's a reason why i'm parking that there because we're going to go into tr you know when you start talking about trauma yeah. and what happens in a war zone which is where this is going yeah. uh, it's important to remember that these is, these were these are undeclared actions these are not legally declared wars mm -hmm. we've not been in a legally declared war since 1942 yeah and correct me on dates if I'm wrong about no, that. No, you're, you're absolutely correct, because the reason that uh, Randy says 1942 is because even though Pearl Harbor was bombed in 1941, it wasn't until the declaration of war in uh, just a week later, because it was Sorry. on December 7th. It was three exactly. weeks and three days later, exactly, yes. that the United Nations was formed in the Presidio military base of San Francisco, where the United Nations was established and World War II, like the Korean conflict, was a United Nations war. It was the United United Nations conflict, and at that point, the United Nations was founded by my native National Republic of China, as well as the Soviet Union, uh, the, the Empire of Greater Britain, France as a republic, and, uh, and and that was pretty much it, along with the United States, and that became the Security Council of the five big nuclear powers, or powers that would allow themselves to be nuclearized once uh, the pro proliferation started, and uh, theoretically was controlled, but we all know that that's, that's a crock, uh, because nuclear proliferation meant, you know, worldwide. But at any rate, um, what Randy is alluding to is the fact that when the United Nations was declared on January 1st of 1942 as an organization of war per Title 42 of the United Nations Charter in lieu of a uh, constitution, they have a charter, uh, it was specifically a war organization, a united front against the combined axis of nations, but what they declared war against was essentially Hitlerism, and they followed that in the spirit of the original declaration of war by the Allies against Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, kind of declaring war against an individual, but by saying Hitlerism, it wasn't against, say, the Napoleonic figure, it was against the idea of whatever to the United Nations represents Hitlerism or, or his ideology. So it was a very astonishingly unusual situation. So you, yeah. you're telling me that we didn't declare war directly against Germany. It, well, it was a direct declaration of war against uh, Germany, Japan, and Italy, and all mm -hmm. of the Axis satellites, what they call the Axis miners, but right. the United Nations as the overall front, the overall united front, declared okay. war against Hitlerism. The, the individual okay. nations okay. could do it differently and do what they wanted to do. A good example of this would be um, what people don't recognize is that when Japan declared war against the United States, all of its Asian allies also declared war. And what Americans don't recognize is how many Asian allies Japan had. They make it sound as if Japan were alone, and it was like Japan was occupying all these other nations like China and uh, Vietnam. But the reality was that Japan was recognizing resistance movements in Vietnam, resistance movements of the French, collaborationist governments in China. So what you had in China was three major governments, aside from the warlords. You had the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek, you had the communist government of Mao Zedong, and you had the Japanese collaborationist government, which most Americans have never heard of, under Yuan Shikai, 
who was a warlord who was ethnically Chinese, who had declared himself the first ethnic Chinese emperor in hundreds of years, because the emperors of China for many hundreds of years were foreigners. They were Mongols and they were Manchus, who are not ethnically Chinese. So this made a situation where when Japan declared war against the United States, so too did Japan allied China or the Chinese government of Yuan Shikai and his dynastic heirs. So uh, that was something most Americans aren't aware of. Vietnam under the Vietnamese emperor Bao Dai, who was in exile after the French had taken over, declared war against America. So the Vietnamese imperial government declared war against America. So did Thailand. Then you had a situation where the British decided, oh, well, we'll recognize the Thai declaration of war as a legal declaration of war. So the British bombed Thailand. They bombed Bangkok. But America said, oh, we don't recognize the Thai declaration of war because we consider them an occupied nation, and they're just doing it under duress. So America never bombed Thailand. And that's why after World War II ended in terms of proactive ceasefire coming about, the Americans were able to come into Thailand and set up bases throughout the Vietnam War, which I know you're familiar with. So, you know, was, let, yeah. me, let me ask you a question here. Sure. What was the strategic interest in these theaters of war locust on in Southeast Asia specifically, but the East? How did the United States wind up entangling themselves in both the external and internal affairs of these, most of them tiny nations except for China and Japan right. and Korea? Right. But what have you been able to glean with the strategic interest to the American people? Well, I know for a fact that Randy asks that just so that we can educate our younger listeners. He already knows. Randy yeah. is, is he lived through it. He knows it was narcotics. He knows it well, was not, drugs. Not, not in Korea. No, I didn't. Oh, oh okay. Well, but, let's, let's, let's specify Korea. Korea is exceptional. Korea. Korea is exceptional. Korea really is. Yeah, uh, is. The, um, but uh, he, to, to put it in a nutshell, as succinctly as possible, what had happened was that when Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president of the United States in 1933, uh, he uh, and Adolf Hitler entered power in the exact same year, 1933. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't remember that fact. Uh, one of the things that brought Franklin Delano Roosevelt into power, something he said himself, was the veterans' protest of the uh, Hoover administration. And what happened was, prior to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, there was a president who nobody remembers named Hoover. <laughs> Herbert yeah. Hoover was this poor bastard who got in at the height of the Great Depression. And uh, what happened was, at that same time, the veterans who had survived World War I uh, basically set up a tent city uh, outside mm -hmm. of the White House for all intents and purposes. And uh, they set up this tent city demanding their pay for World War One, which they had never gotten. Exactly. And, and what happened was uh, Hoover gave the order to burn down the tent city, and he gave it to – actually, he didn't give the order to burn it down. He gave the order for the tent city to be cleared. Uh, he gave the order to three maniacs, and these three maniacs became national heroes. Uh, they were Douglas MacArthur, they were uh, Eisenhower, and they were Patton. So, uh, yeah, Eisenhower and Patton and MacArthur all came in with MacArthur being in charge, Eisenhower being second in command, and Patton doing all the dirty work. They came in with cavalry, World War One era tanks, and World War One era war gas that had been outlawed for use in war, out, you know, internationally. But, hell, since it wasn't international, it was domestic incident. Hey, why not use it? And the reason they could get away with this is because when veterans originally demanded to be paid, it was after the American Revolutionary War. And guess what? George Washington never paid his men either. So what happened was George Washington and all these uh, property-owning, slave-owning, plantation-owning assholes called the Founding Fathers set up a government in what was then Philadelphia, and they said, oh, we've got this great government going thanks to all these peasants doing all the work, so who needs to pay them? Now we're in charge, and well, let's skip that. And then all the... Uh, veterans surrounded them and pointed muskets at their heads and say, pay us or we're going to kill you. And they said, oh, give us a few hours, please. Give us a few, a few days. We'll get everything together out of the Treasury. And then what they did was they evacuated Philadelphia. They didn't pay anybody. Uh, they evacuated Philadelphia and moved the federal government down to Washington District, Columbia, the swamp that became a sewer. And when they got involved with that uh, Washington uh, setup, uh, they declared it 
District of Columbia, so it wouldn't exactly. be part of the United States. And they said, because right. it's not part of the United States, it's got posse comatares absent, meaning that you can kill people here, and legally you won't face any repercussions. So that's why they got away with what they did with killing as many veterans as they did. So when uh, MacArthur gave the order, uh, basically, F clearing the uh, the tent city, let's just burn it. And uh, cavalry charged in with sabers, and a uh, pregnant woman, and this is happening, I'm not making this up for lurid imagery, this genuinely happened. Uh, cavalry horses came in and stampeded over pregnant women and forced them to spontaneously abort. This is, this is what happened because the veterans had their families with them. Children were gassed and died, uh, and uh, in charge of it all was Patton who came to regret what he did. Oh, can you imagine that? And, uh, and and Eisenhower never expressed regret, nor did MacArthur until later in his life. And uh, they basically were convinced that these were all communists and that uh, the men who had served them had become diehard communists, just as all the veterans who had held all of the original founding fathers at Musket Point were rounded up and hanged. Uh, so, too, these men were all killed. So nobody got paid. See, the, the, the reason why Randy is telling you don't join the military is look what happens to these people. They serve in these wars. They don't get paid. They wind up getting killed. They wind up being called traitors. They wind up being called communists. So what is your point of serving? And those that and it's become even worse because we got rid of the draft. And I'll tell you how that made it worse. Uh, but, but essentially, the involvement was that when this horrible incident happened, everybody said get rid of Hoover, put in uh, FDR, because he had been the administrator in charge of the U.S. Navy. He was the assistant secretary of state to the U.S. Navy. He had actually led Marines. This was before he was crippled by polio. He actually led U.S. Marines into Haiti, where he committed severe atrocities, which is why he lost when he first ran for president. When he first ran for president, he was running against uh, the Gamaliel Harding. And, and Gamaliel Harding was a Klansman. And under Gamaliel Harding, the Klan grew more than ever grew before demographically because he was the president and he was recruiting people. Uh, he made Trump look like uh, uh, Gandhi. <laughs> I was and, just going to, you know, I was just going to say, yeah. you, so you thought that the 2016 election was the first time that you had bad and worser yeah. to choose from. Oh, God. Yeah. And, and, and so here's Gamaliel Harding. But you know how he won? He won. And this is important because he was able to expose the fact that FDR had committed such horrible atrocities against blacks in Haiti that he looked like an angel. So you had a Klansman elected over FDR. This is how anti-black, how monstrous the crimes committed by FDR in Haiti were. But, of course, he never faced uh War, crime, war crimes trials for them because it was a foreign nation. No Americans cared. There was no international body of justice at the time. Uh, there was no League of Nations. That was formed after World War I, whereas, of course, Haiti was invaded by the United States under FDR as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, mind you, not as President, leading Marines during World War I. That was America's World War I front was Haiti. And uh, so here he was president all of a sudden. When he became president at the same time as Adolf Hitler, the first thing that he did, aside from taking America off the gold standard, which most people don't recognize uh, or realize, they blame it on Nixon, which is insane. Uh, basically, the other thing he did was he said, I'm going to start a world war. And for years, he had planned it. People can look this up. They can verify what I'm saying. This is important. This is where the Asian wars come in. This is where all the drugs come in was basically FDR said, I'm going to start a world war with England. So he was going to start a world war with England by invading Canada. Now, there was this whole series of coded invasions the United States had developed where it was going to systematically take over the world. There was Cold War Orange, or, or, or War Plan Orange, which dealt with Japan. There was War Plan Red, which dealt with the war with England. And subs subsidiary to War Plan Red was War Plan Crimson, which was the invasion of Canada, which was a British dominion, which would have led to global war with England anyway. But the person who designed War Plan Red, who planned it out, was FDR. Uh, and War Plan Crimson was his idea for invading Canada. He sank an enormous amount of money into building airfields on the Canadian border while he was president, as soon as he became president, to launch air support for his invasion of Canada. He was going to use war gas. He was going to make it a total war against the Canadian population. Uh, this was something people can look this up. Don't take my word for it. Look up War Plan Crimson. Look up Roosevelt's plans to invade Canada. He got the National Guard mobilized. He was marching in on Canada. And people don't understand this. Look up, quote, unquote, the war games held on the Canadian border by the entire National Guard and all the reserves called up by Roosevelt. He was going to invade. And what happened was the Crown of England, the British royal family, said, 
please, if you invade Canada, we'll have no place to run to, to put ourselves as a dynasty in exile if Germany invades England. Look, please, whatever you do, we'll give you anything you want. And what they gave them was China. What happened was the Opium Wars had made England the de facto mm, ruler yes. of China. And the yeah. Opium Wars, my distant relation, my Chinese name is Lin. Uh, my Chinese name is Lin Yiping. That's what I was born with. One of my distant relations, Commissioner Lin, was the major factor in resisting the British during the Opium Wars. He sacrificed his career. He was ultimately put into exile after the British won. The reason a policeman, a police commissioner, was fighting the British was because at that point in time, the Qing Dynasty had no effective military left. So what Commissioner Lin did was he mobilized all of China's police forces to fight the British. But since they were only police with police-grade weaponry, they lost to the British military. When the British military came in, my uh, distant relation, Commissioner Lin, went into exile, and the British essentially ruled all of China. And uh, when they took over China, they instilled the sale of opium. Massive cannonball-sized balls of opium were manufactured in India under the British East India Company, and they were sent by gunboats up the Chinese tributary river system through Vietnam, uh, through the Golden Triangle area into China. Everyone in China, in terms of demographics, statistically, the overwhelming majority of the population became opium addicted. It was required they purchase opium. It was required by British law. And then what happened was, of course, all of this opium trade made the British Empire one of the wealthiest in the world. So what the British gave... Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was their treasury. They gave him the opium trade. So when FDR took over, he said, fine, I won't invade Britain. I'll invade China. And that's where the Flying Tigers came in. Suddenly you had this illegal mercenary air force of all these white Americans in China, and they all tell you, oh, it was to fight the Japs. We were there to fight. Well, what? Well, there's no war. What are you doing there? Oh, well, you know, the chinks are at war with the Japs, so we're there to protect the chinks. And, of course, John Wayne makes films where, you know, the Japanese are bombing orphanages, you know, and, of course, the white guys are coming in to save these poor people. Well, come on, let's get real. What were they doing there? <laughs> Why is anyone there? There's no money to be made off this. You've got a mercenary air force. I mean, this is almost unheard of. We're not talking about Blackwater with boots on the ground. We're talking about men in planes. This is an enormous amount of money to maintain an air force and uh, train pilots. We're not ta We're talking about something. Imagine doing that today, a mercenary air force with men in jets and men to maintain those jets. And you can imagine the cost we're talking about the equivalent thereof in those days. What is paying for this? And it's the drugs. So it turned out what happened was the Japanese were trying to stop the opium trade because you can't run an empire when everybody's doped out. I mean, just look at the shape Randy and I are in, and you know that. And uh, so <laughs> the, the end result was that the only way the Japanese could get an empire to run effectively is to stop people taking all these drugs. So what happened was the CNAC, the China Naval Aviation Corporation, which was a bunch of Douglas DC-10s, a bunch of civilian aircraft like our version of today's uh, cargo planes was flying opium all over China. And so to the Japanese started shooting them down. So to act as interdiction to the Japanese Air Force shooting these drug planes down, the Americans provided an illegal mercenary air force flying under Chinese national colors. And so the, these, they're flying the same flag that my nation flies today, the Taiwanese flag, as it's known, or the nationalist Chinese flag correctly. And uh, so they were flying under those roundels, those colors, those Air Force symbols, and they were doing it to disguise themselves as natives, which was ridiculous because everybody could say they were white. And it was so ridiculous, nobody bothered to hide it because uh, they weren't putting on yellow face or any makeup. So oh, these guys were essentially saying, oh, we're here to protect the Chinese. They were there to protect the drug fl shipments. And when they were flying them, of course, the Japanese would attack them. And that's how they got into an enormous conflict with Japan. So this undeclared war started that everybody knew about. So when my father ran away from home at the age of 16 from Rochester, New York, and joined the Navy, he asked to be taken as far away as possible, and they sent him to China. And he wound up on the gunboat patrols in China, and he was in a state of undeclared war, what was essentially a Vietnam-style conflict. And everybody knew it, because every time he was on leave back home, we're talking about 1936, 1937, 1938, that period of time, 1939, people would ask him, how's the war with Japs? Hey, how's the war with Jeff? Suddenly, Pearl Harbor happens. Everybody says, why did the Japs attack us? Oh, my God. You, now, now, this is the amazing 
how do we say it? The, this is the marvel of the American mind. I mean, this is how the American mind just functions. You're at war, like a Vietnam situation. Everybody knows about it. Suddenly there's an attack on an American territory. It wasn't a state. It's important to remember, Taiwan was not a state of the United States. I mean, uh, Hawaii wasn't a state of the United States at that time. It was a territory, just as Taiwan is claimed to be a territory. That's why I conflated yeah. that. And, and so the Japanese attacked that to prevent American bombing runs into Japan, which the Americans announced they were going to launch. They announced well, it. More correctly, Hawaii was a fiefdom of Dole and yes. the, um, Thank you. the what, a United Fruit, the uh, companies was, that were Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was, I don't remember the name exactly. Uh, United Fruit's a good word for it. Uh, and uh, the, <laughs> the uh, but, but Dole, all, all, uh, this, all yeah, the, 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 the same guy whose grand, son or grandson wound up pushing uh, Viagra. He was one of the first people to push Viagra uh, uh, because he couldn't get it up naturally anymore. Yeah, that's the guy. He's a product of that family who was essentially running Hawaii. It, it was uh, everything Randy says is true. Hawaii was an illegally occupied kingdom. The dynasty of Hawaii had actually asked Japan for help. There's so many things we could go into uh, in terms of details of that, but people get the general idea. And uh, so the Americans get into an outrage, and that's the origin of the China conflict was drugs, which extended into Vietnam. Now, all of that's easy to ascertain. The Korean situation was definitively a remnant conflict of World War II. And the interesting thing is that uh, it's important for people to remember, um, because uh, young children they're not given any hint of this. Uh, Randy can remember this, that prior to World War II, there was no such thing as Korea. Korea, most people don't remember, was actually invaded in the first Korean War of the modern era by the United States. And it was invaded in 1865, 1866, 1867 era. It was right after the American Civil War between the states. And the Americans invaded the Korean Peninsula of all places. And they installed a Caucasian dictator. Now, people can look this up. The man's name was Durham White Stevens. And Durham White Stevens was this white guy who was known as the dictator of Korea. So before you had Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-suk and all the rest of that, you had a white guy named Durham White Stevens. Now, uh, people can look this up. He was assassinated by Korean freedom fighters right here in San Francisco. In front of the ferry That's building. Right. Right. Yes, yeah, it was. Yes, and the, the the Korean guys shot him to death. And when that happened, the New York Times published a headline: "The American dictator of Korea has been shot." And it, this this literally is in the papers. It's it, people can look this up. They can vet what I'm saying. So at that point, after the American white guy had been taken down, the Japanese took over, and they said, "Well, f this. The Americans, you know, that we can't have them running Korea because imagine if a Japanese dictator." We're running Canada. Do you think Americans would feel good about that? Of course not. They'd say, oh, God, we got to do something. So they would probably invade Canada and take over administration. That's what the Japanese did in Korea. So prior to World War II, Korea ceased to exist. It was part of Japan. It was known as the Japanese Peninsula or Chosen, the, the Japanese Peninsula of Chosen. So after World War II came to a ceasefire in the Pacific, what happened was the conflict continued on the Korean Peninsula, and the Americans were trying to reestablish their dictatorship. So the Americans had invaded. Uh, the Russians set up a puppet government, and the end result was a war. And so that conflict was undeclared. It was a continuity of World War II, and that's why it was directly a United Nations conflict. World War II was a United Nations conflict. When the conflict happened on the Korean Peninsula, the Security Council members went for a vote as to how this was going to proceed, and the Soviets walked out. So when the Soviets walked out, everyone who was left said, okay, let's declare war a United Nations peacekeeping action to uninstall this, uninstall this Soviet set-up communist regime. And the Soviets weren't there to protest because they had walked out and forfeited their right to vote. And at that point, the war started, and it was a United Nations conflict. The Soviets indirectly supported the North Koreans. The Chinese, who were not part of the United Nations at that time because they were communist on the mainland now, and the nationalists were established on Taiwan, the Chinese were then at war with communist China, who invaded the Korean Peninsula to support the North. And so that's how that war happened. Now, an uh, important point here. All the bodies being brought back today after Trump spoke with the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un, those bodies that Kim Jong-un is returning in good faith saying, oh, we found some bodies, we think they're American, 
All of those bodies, as has every American body brought back from Korea that died because of that conflict, they're brought back in coffins that are draped in United Nations flags. They're not draped under no. American flags. Yes, the flags no. that are draped over those coffins are United that's Nations blasphemy. flags. <laughs> that's yes. blasphemy. And, and, and that's the way it always was since the Korean conflict itself, because it was a United Nations conflict. Not and See, with World War II, it was different because America had, as a nation state, individually also declared war along with the other nations and the United Nations. That's why people didn't come home in U.N. flags. Uh, under UN flags, but uh, the Korean conflict, they all do. And I told you my father was in Korea. I didn't tell you the level of hatred that he held for the UN mm -hmm. and that most of the people serving in the Pacific uh, theater during Korea, especially the Navy guys that, yeah. that I got to meet, that were my father's brothers in arms, yeah. they despised the UN. I'm sure they did. It. I'm sure they did. Now, did your father ever relate? I know that some of the sailors were forced to do this at the masthead or the flagstaff where the flag flies on the mast of the warship. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes they had to replace the American flag with that United Nations flag. Yes, and that, that was very common reflagging ships yeah. in the that war. I yes. did hear that. Okay, and and also one of the things they would say instead of uh, for God in the United States, they would actually have prayers in the morning, and it would be like various uh, ceremonies. They would say things like for God in the United Nations. It literally was rephrased at that time, and and so yeah. yeah, it's very hard for people to understand now. So it was a very different war, but it brings us right back to the serial killers because with the bases established there. Wait once, a minute! Wait a minute! You yeah. just didn't hear pin turn on me there. <laughs> How did we get back to how did we get back to serial killers, Douglas? Yeah, that's unfair. That's unfair. And and it is important to clarify for our young li listeners when the Vietnam War took place, very much an extension of the Chinese drug conflict because much of the reason for involvement in the Indochina conflict, which became known to the Americans as the Vietnam conflict, was the Golden Triangle, because much of the world's opium at that period of time in history was grown and processed in the Indochinese region of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. So that was the very big reason why you had the heirs to the Flying Tigers, the Air America, as it became known, the CIA Airlines, yeah replaced yeah. them and and that was a direct extension of the flying tigers phenomena so hopefully that puts that into some perspective for our children and to, and, and to put it into even uh harsher starker perspective air america was shipping so much drugs all over the world but specifically into the united states after it yes. was processed into high-grade heroin that it was larger than all the world civilian airlines put together. You put Pan Am, you put uh, TWA, you put all the civilian airlines, Japan Airlines, uh, Lufthansa, you put all uh, Aeroflot, the Russian airline, you put all of them together as civilian airlines, and they came to but a fraction of the fleet of the Air America. That's how much drugs was being shipped into America at the time. That's why they, uh, and by the way, the uh, heroin uh, was processed at a Pepsi Cola refinery of course in it was. Vientiane. Oh. Yeah, Vientiane, <laughs> yeah. the capital of Laos. And yeah, that's, that's where the term came from, the big joke, the Pepsi generation. Mm -hmm. And they made a song of yeah. it. And whoever doubts this, if you ever take a look at the movie Pulp Fiction, those guys yes. are comparing China White and other types of processed heroin. And what do they say? They say, I'll give you the Pepsi challenge. They actually use that term in Pulp Fiction in reference to that. And, and so this is the horror. This was industrialized. This was intentional. This was an entire nation. This is your war on drugs. Is It was basically a war to get you all drugged up. And exactly. Exactly. Yeah, horror. Yeah. 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 The, and, um, yeah. the semantics that are employed by the military-industrial complex are the hallmarks of our culture right now. People do not realize that they are, by watching CNN and Fox and all these other networks, they're hypnotized, mind-controlled into believing the rhetoric that comes out of every level of the government, especially the military. Thank you. Thank you. And, and it's so oxymoronic, like military intelligence, war on drugs. I mean, <laughs> none of it makes any sense. It's the exact opposite. It's 1984. Uh, uh, weakness is strength. Uh, war is peace. It's it's and, and everybody's there. And they 
and they buy it. They eat it up. They they continue to support this military and 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 say that it's 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 wrong to speak against it. And you're under an administration now that wants to uh, create a new branch of service for it. Give it even more money. Uh, hold the space command. Thank you. Thank oh, you. that's right. We don't already have that, do we? Mm, oh, nice. I, well. As, as a matter of fact, by saying that he just wants to consolidate everything into a single branch of service, exactly. that is an admission that it's all been there that's that's the outright admission of it so they're well, not bothering right. yeah. that was my post on facebook today this was just the back announcing of a of a formula that's been in play for decades thank you um thank we you. know it in the alt culture is the secret space program it is a military industrial corporate conglomerate oh yes yes the, and, the yeah. mercantiles of war death yeah. destruction human trafficking pedophilia and just outright destruction of humanity in general. That's going to, this is actually, we're rolling up on the first hour, Doug, and, and I really, really enjoyed uh, what you did for us. Folks, you just heard him regale you on a whole boatload of history, and you can go through and research all this stuff and find out the shit that really went on. That's the value of this. Douglas, tell people where they can find you, your website, and you also have a radio show on American Freedom Radio, so let people know about that. Thank you. Uh, the website's DouglasDietrich.com. Just visit there. And uh, also, uh, I'm on Facebook, as is Randy Malgins. And uh, I'm sure that I'll have to unblock him because I'm sure he was probably blocked by Lorian Ann Fenton, like, you know, uh, half a decade ago or more. And uh, so I'll have to find his name. And, and uh, the other thing to emphasize is, of course, I do have a radio show. And it's on bandwidth, really. So we'll call it a bandwidth uh, transmission. And that's at American Freedom. Radio, and uh, you just go to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, and you can see the schedule. I'm on Mondays and Wednesdays, and uh, those who uh, indulge themselves and support Randy through Patreon will be able to hear the connection between all of this taking us back to serial killers and why the Korean conflict uh, takes us directly back there, and uh, and, and we'll get into that uh, when Randy reintroduces us, and uh, exactly. again, thank you so much, sir. Yeah, man, I'll tell you, i got a guest that can even talk us into the next segment, which we're going to do on the other <laughs> side. And welcome back on this side, Douglas Dietrich. Thank you, sir, and uh, very glad to be here. And uh, again, our thanks to Executrix producer Don Ham Hart, and my thanks personally to Randy yes. Malgins. Uh, for his very congenial hosting, and I'm um, uh, proud to be a guest of his. And uh, the next time we're back, maybe he would have uh, taught me how to use Zoom, and we can actually appear on camera for our guests. We'll, we'll get some kind of video thing together to do that, Douglas. Sounds Not a good. Problem. That's the other thing right now. We battle the gremlins of technology. Yeah. Which, uh, God, don't get me started. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we kind of left off the last hour. We had... Uh, really gone into depth with a lot of history that is not known, that's that's hidden and suppressed about um, the wars that took place in the East. And mm -hmm. uh, now we're gonna now we're gonna wrap it back around. We wanna land in San Francisco at the Presidio mm -hmm. and we're gonna start to get an inside view of your interactions with uh, Michael Aquino and who Michael Aquino is. Right. And who he really is. Yeah, and uh, what we'll also do is contextualize him first, because as I had promised, uh, Michael Aquino himself boasted uh, that his psychological warfare unit had generated many of the serial killers terrorizing the United States, but never so uh, horribly as uh, they were able to do regionally in the state of California. And the state of California was considered a uh, important place to terrorize people because they want to subdue the population in fear because California, as Randy Malgins will tell you, is, of course, the uh, epicenter of much of liberal progressive protest against the military industrial complex. And uh, very important to note, the military industrial complex doesn't do it justice. Uh, one of the things that Eisenhower did in his really just uh, chicken dip uh, Parthian shot on his way out of the presidency was to identify the military industrial complex and people consider him a hero for something he should have done when he first became president as opposed to when he was leaving office. But this individual actually was so chicken dip that he uh, 
at the last minute struck from his speech the uh, title he wanted to use, which was MIC or the MIC, the Military Industrial Congressional Complex, because it's actually Congress that votes these people in. The reason that's important is because that'll take us back to the state of the pedopathocracy and where the pedophilia yes. comes yeah. in. And, this uh, is key. Yes, and it's key to what we'll discuss in our next interview. Uh, and should we be gifted with the opportunity for such, which we'll do our best to make possible, hopefully. So when Absolutely. we come back to thank you, and when we come back to the serial killers, and that brings us back to Michael Aquino directly. One of his creations was the Golden State Killer. Now that actually connects directly to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Joseph James D'Angelo is 72 years old. He's a former police officer, and he's a mechanic who served in the United States Navy during the Vietnam War. He was identified uh, just a few months ago as the serial rapist and killer who terrorized California in the 1970s and 1980s. That's as far as we know. A lot more must have been done since that point, and we just never learned of it. He faces at least a total of 12 counts of murder in Santa Barbara, Orange, Ventura, and Sacramento counties, Sacramento being the capital uh, county of the state of California. He was finally arrested at his home in Citrus Heights, which is a Sacramento suburb right in the capital of our state, on April 24th of last year, uh, of this year, excuse me, after investigators linked DNA, dioxyribonucleic acid, from the decades-old crime scene to D'Angelo using an online genealogical database. But he's uh, basically on trial now or going through a series of trials, which, of course, take forever, and ultimately his fate will likely be, hopefully, the death sentence. But family members, and that includes 35-year-old Jesse Ryland, who's a nephew of Joseph James D'Angelo, they confessed that decades before he killed at least 12 people that we know of and sexually assaulted over half a hundred others, again, only 51 that we know of in this crime spree that terrorized our state, he was suspected of being the Golden Gate State Killer because his family knew that he had watched two men rape his younger sister at an Air Force base in Germany. This brings us to the foreign bases, and I'll bring it right back to Korea. It's all these foreign bases all over the world that this shit takes place that is never heard of back in the United States. Joseph James D'Angelo was playing with his sister Constance in an abandoned warehouse on this base in Germany when two airmen in full United States Air Force uniform walked in and raped her in front of him. D'Angelo was about 9 or 10 years old at the time. His sister was 7 years old. And, of course, his nephew Ryland learned about the incident from his mother, meaning D'Angelo's wife, uh, or, or sister, rather, just before she died from cancer last year. So his father, Joseph D'Angelo Sr., served in the United States Air Force. That's how the family was on this base, family moving frequently because of his job. And after this violent incident on base in Germany, military police warned Joe Sr., of course, because he was violent all the time to his wife and repeatedly beating his wife while this was going on with his son, uh, he was beating her so much that it was bad on the Air Force image, so they warned him he'd be kicked out if he kept beating his wife. And when all of this was investigated, you can vet what I'm saying. It turns out a spokesperson for the National Personal Records Center, the NPRC, which, of course, was burned down to destroy the overwhelming majority of records mm -hmm. from m millions of servicemen who served from the time of World War II, the Spanish-American conflict, all the way up through the Vietnam conflict. All of their records were put in this fire trap, which was burned to the ground. It had no sprinkler system, was built against the protestations of the regional fire department in St. Louis, Missouri. But because yes. it was federal, they couldn't protest it. Yeah. But it goes beyond what even Randy I'm told, knows. Yeah. I'm told, that, I, and I got this from an insider, yeah. I'm told that the records of a lot of the people who were involved in MK Ultra in the 1960s were also incinerated in that same fire. Well, absolutely. Not only that, but even celebrity records, like yes. the records yeah. of uh, the uh, man who assassinated Martin Luther King Jr., James Earl Ray's records were destroyed there. The military records of the man who's accused of assassinating John F. Kennedy. Uh, oh, God, Lee what's his Lee name? Oswald. Thank you. His records were destroyed there but it goes beyond that the man who designed the building was a japanese architect a japanese american the man who was allowed not to go into internment camps during world war ii and he was given his freedom in exchange for building that record center with no <laughs> sprinkler system no fire alarms he's the same man who built the twin towers 
Oh, think about that for a bit. Oh, my. I have to dig his name up because <laughs> his name escapes me at the exact moment. Uh, yeah. But people can look up the Japanese architect who designed the Twin Towers and the National Personal Record Center, and you'll find it. As a matter of fact, uh, we might ask Don Ham Hart to do that for us. I don't have to do that while we're on air. And uh, the um, uh, anyhow. The important thing that is that we, when the spokesperson for the NPRC was contacted, which manages the military records for veterans who served throughout the 20th century, uh, the files for both Joseph Sr. and Joseph Jr. were not available for the public because another government agency had seized them. Well, which government agency would do that? Well, the National Security Agency, the NSA, because... Currently, the departmental chief, who's one of the vice executives of the NSA, a kind of a deputy director, if you will, just like a CEO, there's many uh, second heads or secondary CEOs to a corporation. Uh, <laughs> basically, in terms of uh, Michael Aquino, he is a deputy director of the NSA. By the way, fabulous. Uh, Don Hamhart found the name for us. And yes, now. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, let me see now. I'll have to uh, recover that. Now, what I'm afraid of is if I look up the text, I might wind up getting rid of it. Can you read that for us? Because I can't, uh, I can't access the text. Actually, it popped up on me, and then it, then it bounced it, away. It bounced again. away. Could you put it up again? Yeah, Don? okay, so uh, let yeah. me read what, what she put in here. In 1962, Minoru Yamasaki was given an improbable, totally ridiculous task. Yamasaki, a Japanese-American architect, best known at the time for his modernist designs of airports, universities, buildings, and synagogues, that's interesting, yeah. won the World Trade Center job in 1962 over more internationally famous architects. Yes, and he designed the World Trade Center in the model of an Islamic mosque because he had also been hired by the Arab people of the House of Saud to build their airport. He is actually, the airport he designed for Saudi Arabia is on one of their higher currency uh, issued bills. And uh, they actually use that on their money. So, uh, yes, uh, Yamoro, uh, I'm sorry, Masaki was it? Yamoro. Yamasaki. Yamasaki, thank you. Uh, think of like, uh, uh, oh God, what was the Kawasaki? But make it Yamasaki instead. Yamasaki. Yeah, it's and a with, Yamaha and a Kawasaki. Hybrid. Thank you, thank you. A Yamaha and Kawasaki hybrid. Thank you. I finally have a mnemonic which I can remember that by. Yeah. Thank you. Sounds like one of those motorcycles I rode as a kid. There we are, a rice rocket. Yes, Yamasaki. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, he he was contracted to build several federal housing projects by the U.S. government. He built the NPRC, which burned all the records down, so it would be able to burn down effectively, and he built the Twin Towers so they could collapse immediately. Isn't that incredible? He's dead now, just so people know, so they don't go out gunning for the guy and waste their energy and effort. But he was uh, uh, left outside of the internment caps, given total freedom, uh, because he w agreed with the government to do all this evil sh stuff. And so, um, at any You're rate... allowed to cuss, by the way. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry? I said you're allowed to cuss. Oh, okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I very much do. So, we like uh, tasteful profanity here. There we are. Thank you. So we've we've gotten into the point where um, Joseph D'Angelo, all the records have disappeared, which, of course, is important to bring up because people who constantly try to discredit myself or decry what I say always try to point to military records. And then they'll claim crap about Freedom of Information Act. It's, it's so preposterous to me. It's like approaching Satan himself and saying, the devil told me that this happened, this happened. I mean, what kind of information are you going to get through the government from Freedom of Information other than misinformation? It is preposterous to me that people even rely on that as a documents yeah. instruction expert. It's, it's, it's laughably ridiculous. So the important thing to remember is that on that military base where uh, Joseph D'Angelo Jr. saw his younger sister get raped, uh, Ryland, his nephew, confirmed that uh, when his uncle and his mother told their parents about what had happened in the military base warehouse, they were instructed never to discuss it. Now, this is all part of MK Ultra, and what happened was almost certainly his father, Joseph D'Angelo Sr., I would bet my soul, I would lay my soul on the altar, his father offered the sister up to be raped by airmen in full uniform mm -hmm. in front of yes. his uh, relation so that his son could be traumatized for traumatized. life. Mm -hmm. And this is all part of that. Whoever doubts that, let me remind you that Joseph D'Angelo Sr. retired 
to South Korea. Now, think about the absurdity of what I'm saying. This is what military men do. Here's South Korea, which is threatened by communist invasion. It's legally at war with North Korea to this day. North Korea and South Korea are in a state of war, something brought to attention by Trump's talks with Kim Jong-un. People who don't recognize that forget the threat of the nuke against Hawaii recently because North Korea is still in a state of war with South Korea, which is allied with the United States. All of this was feeding on that fear of a state of war. So this guy decides he's going to retire in a nation that's in a state of war whose capital is right across a demilitarized zone from an overwhelming communist military force. He retired there and he had another set of kids, hybrid children like myself, Amerasians, half American, half Asian, with a Korean wife, and he gave all three of those kids the same names as his first three children, Rebecca, Joseph Jr., and Constance, as confirmed by Jesse Ryland and Kenneth Ryland Sr. So his own family said he created a cloned set of kids for all intents and purposes, Amerasian, but same sex balance, same sex ratio, one girl, two boy, uh, two girls, one boy, and gives them the exact same names as his three Caucasian kids. All of this part of a generational trauma, intergenerational trauma as generated by abuse, satanic ritual abuse. And that brings us, of course, to the congressional aspect of the military-industrial congressional complex, which will bring us back to Aquino and the Presidio okay. military base. When it came to the United States, what happened was at the end of the American War of Nations, the Confederate States of America and the United States of America on the North American continent, what happened was after that, in about 1865, a pirate flag was run up over both the United and Confederal States of America. And the way that this happened was a genuine election was held. The person who won that was your 19th American president, and his name was Samuel Tilden, I believe. And people can look up the 19th American president, and you'll find out Rutherford B. Hayes was the president who won. You can look up the man who ran against it. I believe the guy's name was Samuel Tilden. And this individual won by a landslide. Not only did he win by millions of votes, he also won the Electoral College. Then what happened was the union came in, and they basically, through a series of bribes, threats, got the Electoral College overturned by a single vote after they overturned the original count in several key areas, the same ones that usually get overturned in the oh, South. shades of the 2000 thank election. Thank you, thank ah. you, thank you. <laughs> yes, they did it in New Orleans and Miami, the same place where, again, another hanging chad was counted by a federal judge who decided who your president yeah. was going to be for the next uh, four to eight years, uh, who happened to be uh, a judge who was put in power by Jeb Bush, who did everything to make himself the governor of the state of Miami, including converting to Roman Catholicism and marrying a Latina, who, after he won the governorship of uh, the state of, of Florida, uh, he divorced this Latina sent her to Mexico where she lives on a hacienda and she's referred to as the dark one. Uh, she's got a bunch of half-breed kids by him, but nobody really knows her name. Uh, but everybody knows she was his wife when he got voted in by the Cubans who honestly thought he had turned brown on him. And then the judge he put in power chose uh, W. And then after that, you had something similar happen with 2016. It, this goes on all the time. But the man who stole the election uh, on the basis of the rail robber barons of the American Civil War, which was a railroad war, uh, every major yes. battle took place within... 10 miles of track, the rail robber barons needed to expand west, and so they wanted a man who would vote for them to do that. Well, the man who had won instead was a Democrat, which at that point made Klans, meant Klansmen, meant Demo Dixiecrat, meant Solid South. So it's bizarre that so shortly after the American Civil War, a southern uh, copperhead, as they used to call him in the north, a southern sympathizer, Samuel Tilden, won. So they couldn't have that because they wouldn't have expansion into the west because the rail robber barons were all up north and they wanted that. And so they put in Rutherford B. Hayes, who was a Union general. Now, at that point, you had a military junta, essentially, backed by the industry, which is known as a military-industrial complex. That was the birth of your military-industrial complex, was 100 years after 1776 in 1876. So at that point in time, the question for the military became, how do we keep the civilians in control? So what they developed was the pedopathocracy. They would compromise the overwhelming majority of the civilian politicians. And the way they did this was they raised a series of boys 
to have sex with them. Now, you can look up what happened at the Dozier Dig in Florida. Horrible story. Uh, Dozier, I believe, is spelled D-O-Z-I-E-R, if I remember correctly. They found over 100 bodies of young boys that were buried in this boys' home, uh, kind of like a boys' town where orphan juveniles went who were juvenile delinquents, and they tortured them mercilessly until they died. This was to force them to acquiesce to sex with politicians. Now, the man who wrote the book on those boys, it's titled The White House Boys. You can look that book up yourself. And the White House boys were sent to the White House to have sex. That, that boys' town ran for over a 100 years, and when they were done having sex with them to prevent them from talking, they killed them and buried them in graves that were only a few inches deep. And uh, when you take a look at the photographs of all those shallow graves where all those boys were exhumed from, boys that the locals claim never had been there, boys that there were no records of, uh, we don't even know who many of them are. We know they were kept in this home, tortured mercilessly, and forced to have sex with adult male politicians at the White House. Now, all of this is verifiable. All of the forensic autopsies and evidence that you could desire are there to prove all of this happened. This isn't a myth. This is your pedopathocracy in action. This is what your military called their super soldiers. What they call their super soldiers are super victims. These are boys who, like Max Spears, like James Casbold yeah. slash Michael Prince, were raised to have sex with adults. Now, you mm -hmm. might point out, well, Max Spears and James Casbold, Michael Prince, they're English. They're British citizens. That's true. That's because Michael Aquino was on Second Mint to NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. He was a member of the World Affairs Council. He had an international security clearance. And because of this, Michael Aquino had access to Britain from the highest levels of power. Beyond that, Michael Aquino was a cultist who had organized his own satanic church, the Temple of Set. He originally converted to Satanism under the first Church of Satan, which had been developed by a Jewish American who was named Anton Zandor LaVey. That wasn't the name he was born with. He was born with a different name, similar, uh, but he chose the name Anton Zandor because it was more theatrical. And he worked in a circus. He had done many things in his life. He was charming. He was well-spoken. He was uh, a person who actually was so daring that he shipped uh, a bunch of National Socialist surplus weapons out of Germany from German bases, helped by men like the father of D'Angelo Sr., and took these old Nazi weapons uh, through San Francisco, where my operations manager of the Presidio Military Base Library took him into his own home as a stopping point where they could essentially wait until the heat cooled down before they shipped him to Israel. So here's a Jew who's selling Nazi weapons to Israel after he him, himself learned of what had happened in the Holocaust. So you've got an individual here who obviously has no morals, no scruples, and that's the founder of the First Church of Satan, the Black Pope of San Francisco, who worked out of his black house in San Francisco, the uh, home that he had on Arguello Street, right outside the Presidio military base, where his own cousin was a staff member in the U.S. Army Reserves, in the Presidio military base. But he converted uh, Michael Aquino shortly after Rosemary's baby was released, because his eyebrows, that of uh, Anton Zandor LaVey's, are the eyes of Satan in the Rosemary's Baby film. And uh, when he was there for the original cinematic release, one of the people who was also there to view it was Michael Aquino. Michael Aquino met him right outside the theater, where he quickly became a convert to the original Church of Satan. The difference between them was that uh, Anton Zandor LaVey was a proud atheist. His form of Satanism was an atheistic Satanism. He took the Jewish philosophy of the Russian Jewish immigre, who was named Ayn Rand. That wasn't her right, original name, right. which was very Russified and uh, a Slavic yeah. name even difficult for me to remember and pronounce. And Ayn Rand uh, created what she wanted to be a contrapuntal to atheistic communism developed by the Jewish intellectual out of Germany, Karl Marx, whose original name was Rabbi Levi. 
and uh, and it had several of the Jewish names in there. I'd, I'd have to look up to recall uh, Max Yoshiev. It, it was a very complicated Jewish name he was born with. He changed it to Karl Marx because it was a pen name and sold better. Yes, yes. And uh, so you've got this conflux of Jewish philosophies from atheistic communism to atheistic capitalism of Ayn Rand to the atheistic Satanism of Anton Zandor LaVey. And Anton LaVey wanted a to do nothing, wanted to have nothing to do with church tax exemption. So he was a proud payer of taxes. Well, Aquino wasn't having any of that shit. So he established the Temple of Set as a bona fide church, a theistic Satanism. A 501c3 corporation. Thank you, sir. So yes. he could... Uh, so he could perform a legal form of tax evasion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Michael Aquino, after that, began to set up branch offices or uh, church uh, branch offices, what you would call essentially what he called pylons. Uh, mm -hmm. In other areas, you'd call them like uh, bishoprics mm -hmm. or uh, other churches, you would just call them uh, spreading the faith. But his cult uh, dissemination uh, of other nations, particularly England, because of its Crowleyite history, these pylons were set up to take advantage of England's history of Crowleyite Satanism, which had simply been the culmination of the British ruling classes converting to diabolism centuries ago under the Hellfire Club, which, as Randy Malkins mm -hmm. knows, essentially ran the British Empire. Uh, yeah, throughout. Ben Franklin was, was known to go there and free when, when he was in town. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Uh, and and no, that was his version of the Bohemian Club. Exactly. In those days, for Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin, and I know Randy's probably familiar with this, but it needs to be emphasized, your founding fathers are no one to admire. The important thing to remember is they're not the yeah. founders of a Christian nation. They were deistic, meaning that yes. they believed that the universe was the creation of a god gone away who had left his clockwork mechanism abandoned, and therefore they could fill his place on the throne as gods themselves. That's what deism translates into in his extreme fundamentalism, which is what they were, the Taliban version of deism. And your founding fathers were also Satanists, many of them. That includes Benjamin Franklin, who, of course, his home, they found multiple bodies, talk about serial killers, of blacks, Africans, who he was using to experiment on because he was stitching pieces of the bodies together from different cadavers to create a Frankenstein's monster that he was trying to reanimate with electricity, which was why he was always out in the rain with a kite and a key, trying to get electricity directly juiced into his cadavers to get them moving. Many of them would animate temporarily the way a frog would animate when it's jarred with electricity or any kind of nervous stimulus. Uh, people were saying that that was simply a kind of reflex mechanism in the cadavers. There are stories where some of them got up and moved. He, what he created would later on be more, shall we say, accurately portrayed, however luridly, in black exploitation films like Blackenstein. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the inspirations for Mary Shelley's novel. Now, all of this is what your founding fathers were really all about. These were the men admired by Michael Aquino. These were the traditions that he was working on. He could never have gotten into power and the positions that he had without a history behind him. Nor could he have done what he did in England. It brings us back to the pedopathocracy. When he was in England, he was working with elements of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, people can look this up. One of the most secular nations in the world today is Ireland. Ireland's had its fill of the Roman Catholic Church because of its history of criminality. This isn't to say that the church shouldn't go on or that it can't be rehabilitated, but like any establishment that's been around for thousands of years, it's important to remember its position, and this will bring us back to Aquino, its position in the cosmology. In the cosmology, a priest of any kind of church is like a peace officer or a law enforcement agent. Anyone who's an FBI agent, anyone who's a police officer, is in danger of corruption because of all the crime they deal with. They have to deal with informants. They have to deal with people who are criminals, who expose other criminals. In the end, they have to cooperate with criminals. In the end, many churches that are established for hundreds or thousands of years have to find a way to cooperate with the diabolic and the demonic towards what ultimately many of them at the higher levels of authority might strategize as a greater good. These forces corrupt the men who are operationally in contact. Many of them go native. 
Many of them become diabolic themselves. Many of them become child molesters to feed that diabolism. That's what's explaining the Roman Catholic Church. It's not mere perversion. It's a satanic insurgency as if an entire police department had been con corrupted from street crime because of the cops walking the beat, actually using the hookers, pipping them out. Uh, this is what happened in San Francisco when I first got involved with security at the bottom level of the industry. I worked at the adult entertainment centers in San Francisco. At that period in time, I never even knew we had a SWAT team until I worked at those adult entertainment centers because the SWAT team spent all day at the strip club. And all of the strippers, many of them, at least enough to say the majority, wore very long gloves over their elbow, not just to look sexy, but to hide the heroin injection scars. Uh, and this, yeah. of course, who was selling them the heroin? The cops, who brought it in off the street from men they had busted. The drugs would be taken from dealers on the street and sold by the cops to the strippers. Uh, this is the kind of industry that takes place in the church spiritually. This is what corrupts a church as old as the Catholic Church. And because of this corruption, you have cisterns, sewage tanks in Ireland that they've uncovered that were filled with hundreds of baby bones, bones of infants, bones of young children that had been murdered and thrown into these septic tanks to rot for centuries, or at least half a century, until they were uncovered. Some of the bones over a hundred years old, some only half a hundred years old. But these bones were the products of women, children, uh, females of many ages, uh, who had been raped by the elite of Ireland. And to hide the children from being born, to come back later to claim an inheritance, they were killed by the Catholic Church, yes. by these nunneries. So it was on the basis of this history that Aquino went to England with all of his connections with the Hellfire Club, and that's where he took children from the orphanages of the Catholic Church. Nuns would give children to him. One of them was Christine Joanna Hart. Christine Joanna Hart, on record and interviewed by myself on bandwidth, and uh, of course she will tell you this and confirm it, her earliest memory in life is uh, riding up and down on the erect phallus of Michael Aquino at the age of three. And after that, she never was really able to escape his influence. One of the reasons I had to sever connections with her was because she wanted to interview him again, wanted to bring him back on bandwidth, wanted to welcome him back into her life. She never needed to do that because he's always been there. And of course, she's still being tragically abused by him in ways I'll go into if questioned. We don't need to do that right now. We're going to go into that's how it brings into Max Spears and James Casbolt slash Michael Prince. These yeah. were young men taken out of England, still have their English accents, and what happens is these individuals were used as, like the White House boys, pedo prostitutes for the political elite of the United States. And that's how they wound up being abused to the point where their only real escape was to have a cascade memory that would protect them from psychologically totally breaking down as being trained assassins. This isn't to say they were trained to kill people. When Max Spears and James Casbolt get on video together and you've seen videos of them kind of laughing and saying, oh, we killed him too, oh yeah, and you, you see, that's the testosterone, that's the machismo, this is their bravado and their need to, to, to compensate for their years of victimization of being abused as, as children. And at the same time, there are people that they may have killed because of the reality that they were trained to do so in case the politician ever became conscience-stricken. This is what happens in terms of the pedopathocracy. You have these individuals who take up with young boys, and the boys are preferred because they're far more scandalous than young girls. And what happens is that when the young boys are suddenly dismissed by the politician, by that time the young boy has gotten to know wherever the politician lives. Oftentimes they've slept with them in certain estates. They've slept with them on certain property. They know aspects of the politician no one else knows, where he goes to hide his dirty secrets. And that boy could expose them. The politician might threaten to kill that boy, or the politician might threaten to bribe the boy. At that point, the boy is programmed to kill both the politician and himself. That way the family is always threatened with, 
if your dad breaks with voting for Buku funding for the military, if he doesn't vote to give us a space force, if he doesn't vote to give us an air force, which never existed until 1947, until after World War II was declared a ceasefire, here you have these new branches of service being generated that get billions of dollars in finance. Whenever someone says, no, I'm not going to vote for that, well then, you'll die, and when you die, that boy will kill himself with you, and the reporters will come in and find you in bed with a naked boy. Both of you naked. And they'll tell the family that. If your family doesn't cooperate with us, your politician, the most famous one among you, whoever it is, Ted Kennedy as a potential example, etc., whoever it might be, just using that as an example of the idea, then what will happen is he's going to be found dead naked in bed with a young boy. Well, no family can afford that. So they actually encourage the politician, keep your mouth shut, cooperate, have fun with the boy, don't do anything. And uh, whenever something happens, then the politician's found dead with the naked boy next to him. Now, you almost never hear of that. That's because no one dares. No one dares to have that happen. And the end result is the politicians instead become true addicts. And they do things like what they did at St. Martin's Preschool, uh, various other areas. They pick and choose who they want off a menu. Uh, but the real specialists that they love are oftentimes the British importes, like British nannies. And that's what made Max Spears and James Casbolt slash Michael Prince, that's what made the people in such high demand. But in order to keep them functioning, they are off given a different cascade memory where they feel they're more like the boys in the Kingsman film, mm -hmm. where they're going mm -hmm. out and they're killing people, they're saving the world, they're kicking ass. That's how they live with themselves. So when people say that James Casbolt slash Michael Prince is a psychotic fantasist, yes, he is. But he's a product of a specific program to make him such. The man is a victim, as was Michael Spears, Max Spears, excuse me. And when I first met him uh, at the same place where I met Don Ham Hart through Laurie and Ann Fenton at these various conferences, that's what closed for me the circle of people I saw being created by Michael Aquino when I was liaising with him under orders. That brings us back to the summonings. We may as well get now into some of the heart, uh, the uh, darkness, the heart of darkness of the Presidio military base. What was going on with Michael Aquino? Let me just, let me sure. just talk, let's, let's just tie a couple things together because you go really fast and dense and uh, I, t I tend to, to want to underscore some things. First off, this... What did you describe it? The pedo... Pedopathocracy. Pedopathocracy. Perfect. That, that's, that's a great term. So the pedopathocracy has historical antecedents going back. You can, you can look this up in the Old Testament of the Bible of sacrifice to Moloch, which was a sat satanic ritual sacrifice of babies. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's in all of our history of how children have been used, largely... Energy harvested, sacrificed, used sexually, boys and girls, and trafficked all over the world like delicacies for the elite. Yes. And in doing that, effectively, you, you, I've been saying for probably 10 years that pedophilia is how business is transacted on the global scene. And I think you just pretty much underscored that point. In, in a very succinct way, Douglas, because it's, it accomplishes two ends. First, it is itself a currency. It is also a means of compromising and silencing pawns on the game board. And finally, it is also a satanic ritual. Yes, it is all of that combined. A great example of this type of victimization uh, is a wonderful woman. I, I, I used to party with her and Max and, uh, and, and of course, with Haley Mayer. And uh, all three of us got to know each other through uh, the same way that I got to know Dawn Ham Hart through Laurie and Ann Fenton. So I never would have met these wonderful people without the horror story that was Laurie Ann Fenton. <laughs> so in, in a very real sense, she was worth every penny that she stole. So there is a balance in the world. And uh, all of the money that she stole from myself, 
uh, is, is but a pittance compared to the treasure of the memory of Max Spears, uh, the time that I had with Sarah Rachel Adams and, uh, uh, and Haley Mayer and, of course, uh, Don Ham Hart. It's very important to remember this and keep this in context. And that's what keeps myself sane and functional. The, in, and not bent on vengeance and destruction uh, from a sense that would be deconstructive or non-productive, counterproductive. And uh, one of the things that we have to remember is that Sarah Rachel Adams is um, someone to be admired, someone to be supported. At the same time, she's victimized and she kept Max alive because essentially she had been programmed to be his handler. It was a positive in the sense that when he was taken away from her, when he was lured away from her, he was intensely vulnerable and they were able to do him in. We could go into details of how and who uh, at some time when you're ready for that. I'm happy to name names. But the reality is that uh, Max Spears was kept alive by Sarah Rachel Adams. At the same time, take a look yeah. at her initials. Her very name, SRA, SRA. It, is... Yeah. Satanic ritual Satanic abuse. Ritual abuse. Yes, and yeah, I know. I know. I've I've had contact with Sarah, mm-hmm. um, and you know as well as I do. This even goes into the Laurie and Fenton thing. Yeah, dealing with people in the system is an up and down roller coaster ride. And unfortunately, as much as I like some of these people, and as much as I think they're admirable, mm-hmm. dealing with them has become something that's very difficult to do because of the amount of control that's exerted over them and their own programming. Yes, yes, very much so. And it's, a, it, and it's one of those things uh, that I've always observed is uh, uh, in no way, shape, or form to denigrate her or besmirch her or... or, or, or no, not at all. Foul her name. All. Someone is supporting her. conversations with Sarah. Yeah, yeah, but somebody is definitely supporting her. I mean, it, it's incredible. She dresses well, she eats well, I mean, well, she she kind of starves herself, but aside from all that, the uh, uh, it, yeah, she's she's obviously in a sense kept. So uh, it's it's important to make these observations. As is Christine Joanna Hart. Um, her son goes to a very exclusive school. She lives in Kensington. Uh, Who I've also it, interacted with, and yeah. unfortunately, that came to an end as well. Yes, well, that's <laughs> it, as as it had to with myself for the reasons yeah. that we which I've just articulated, which I'm sure impacted you as well. And uh, important to remember, she is very kept. She's a controlled individual. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these things have to be kept in context. And uh, the uh, in in terms of uh, what we have where we uh, return to the subject at hand of the Presidio military base, how I wound up there as quickly as possible in this hour, what brings us back to the assassination of George Moscone. Essentially what happened was his lap secretary, the unofficial secretary who serviced him uh, while he was in office, was a woman named Leanne Prifty, uh, Albanian name. She was of Albanian uh, ethnicity and spoke the language. And what happened was that Leanne Prifty uh, was not needed by Diane Feinstein. When Diane Feinstein came into office, uh, Diane Feinstein, uh, at least uh, she may be a lesbian for all we know, but she certainly didn't want to present herself as one. So she fired Leanne Prifty immediately, saying, I don't need George Moscone's lap secretary. Now, Leanne Prifty wound up out of City Hall and looking for a job and wound up being a secretary at John O'Connell Vocational Institute, the very institute where I had gone to learn a trade. Now, she also worked for Radio Free Europe, uh, which was a propaganda arm of the CIA and the State Department, uh, used to broadcast behind the Iron Curtain various uh, transmissions that would maybe uh, uh, provoke people into insurrection or even revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Albania at that time was under Enver Hoxha, a communist dictator. So while she was transmitting all this stuff and working for the feds, uh, she made me aware, well, you got military dependent status, meaning my father, of course, was a retiree from a career in the military, so I had full access to the open areas of the Presidio military base, which was an open base, had to be, because it had the Golden Gate Bridge going through it. And uh, because of that, yeah, yeah, well, because every the Golden Gate Bridge, just so people know, was built, every screw, every cable, every ounce of material that went into that Golden Gate Bridge had to go through the Presidio military base so the military could basically claim, uh, you know, basically, um, I forget the word for it, inspect it and make certain it wasn't uh, sabotaged by a terrorist, by a subversive. So because of that, 
that security, uh, as maintained by the military, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge was built from the Presidio military base out towards the other end of the bay, towards Oakland. It wasn't built from both ends. It was built strictly from one side to the other. And uh, so wow. it went straight through the base. And for that, Yeah. And, and so for that reason – and by the way, it used to have a monorail. You spin a monorail that went under the Golden Gate Bridge. I saw the plans and the photographs. I was ordered to destroy all of them. All of that metal was taken off the Golden Gate Bridge because they wanted every available piece of metal they could for war work when they were planning the war, when they built the Pentagon. And that was uh, exactly uh, 100 years, uh, or no, excuse me, about 63 years or so, uh, prior to the date of the 2001 uh, attack on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. Uh, the Pentagon was uh, undergoing the earth-turning ceremony, the earth-breaking ceremony, uh, to celebrate its opening construction by General Leslie Groves, the same man who worked on the atomic bomb project, who turned that golden shovel into the dirt. Uh, and what he said was, we're going to build the biggest office building the world has ever seen, now keep in mind this was September 11th of 1941, uh, just a few months before Pearl Harbor, and yes. he said, we're going to build the biggest office building the world has ever seen because we're going to launch the biggest war the world has ever seen, and we are going to need all the metal for tanks and planes and guns and uh, everything you can imagine. So they began to scrap all the metal from places like the Golden Gate Bridge, and no metal was used in the building of the Pentagon. The building, the Pentagon building was built with no elevators because that would take metal cable. So the Pentagon was built entirely of concrete with ramps, and people go around on little go-karts like golf carts because there was originally no elevators and nothing metal in the Pentagon. It was all made out of concrete because they needed all the metal for war work. So there you have that. And they didn't want to burn like, you know, the NPRC did. Uh, so, so they have all that. So with the uh, Presidio military base, here's Leanne Prifty. She had this knowledge that, oh, a job's opening, a summer job at the Presidio military base library. Why don't you go get it since you've got a military dependence ID? And I thought that was a great idea. So I wound up going over there, applying for a summer job. And uh, that, of course, brings us to Michael Aquino, who said, oh, I want this particular librarian to serve as my liaison, uh, basically kind of like a gopher and uh, kind of like an aide-de-camp in responsibilities. And uh, it turned out, I realized later, he had probably been watching over me since childhood, and he had probably selected me at a very specific time in life and uh, wanted mm -hmm. me to serve him. And uh, when you think about it, it is possible. It is possible. He might have had other games and stratagems in mind. It is possible the assassination of San Francisco's mayor might have been done specifically so that secretary could get fired so she could wind up at the high school I was at to get me that summer job. Now, it probably had other stratagems, such as making Diane Feinstein the mayor and ultimately in the position of power she has today. I'm sure that was just as important. But collateral to that, or subsidiary, ancillary to that, seems to have been it was all maneuvered because ultimately the high school I went out to, that secretary was there. She got me the summer job. I wound up liaising with Aquino. All of this on the basis of a super soldier named Dan White who assassinated a mayor of a major city and never spent a day in jail. Wound up killing himself sure. seven years later. Yeah, and uh, so it's an incredible series of events. It can't be coincident. It's not circumstantial. It is conspired. There are conspiracies. And uh, this conspiracy becomes obvious in light of what happened. Of course, Things go wrong, <laughs> and everything went wrong with Michael Aquino. Sometimes things would go wrong with the summonings. Very important for people to remember what a summoning is. Michael Aquino was, of course, someone who very much was a occult practitioner. He was genuine. He was someone who originally cut his teeth in Vietnam. And it's important to remember uh, Michael Aquino was in Vietnam, and he did see service. But then so did a sick son of a bitch like Master Sergeant Michael Ramirez of the U.S. Army Green Berets. Uh, so did many people who attacked myself and later on tried to discredit myself by producing false documents. Now, my documents aren't available any more than the serial killer Joseph D'Angelo or his father are available. My documents are in possession of the NSA. They are not accessible through Freedom of Information Act. They're not there for anyone to find. So it's easy for people to claim, oh, well, you must have never served. As if that means something in light of what I expose. Because I'm certainly 
never anyone who makes a deal of my having, quote unquote, served as pivotal to what I have to say. So when I get in front of you as a public informant, and then you get people such as the individual who recently died in a backfire spellcasting, mind you, and we'll get into the spellcasting here, a guy named John Victor Aurelier, a so-called master sergeant in the U.S. Army Green Berets, who was really nothing other than an infantryman, but because he was favorite of Aquino, was given this honorary status in the Green Berets and pumped himself as such, he actually forged documents saying I wasn't in the military, saying my father didn't do in the military what I know my father did and what is on record as having done. And, of course, I brought on, in turn, a federale from the Veterans Affairs Bureau named Gary States to prove that everything this man put online was a forgery. Now, all of that was said by a man employed by the Veterans Administration himself, Gary States. And, of course, it was proven by many other Veterans Administration bureaucrats, such as Paul Mosslander, a lady I know, now my medical cosmetologist who used to work with the VA named V. Clark. All of these people proved on record that that was a forged document, which means it's a felony. So the man was headed towards prison. He had been stripped of all of his benefits. He tried to conduct a ritual against myself to kill myself. He wound up dying of a heart attack. John Victor Lillier, dead on April 26th, or July 26th, excuse me, July 26th of last month. And uh, so... <laughs> There you have that. Now, let's go into how such a ritual can backfire. Uh, yeah, Let me think, look. So sure. Are you going to go into the summoning, or can you define that? The, I yes. want to make sure that people understand as you're dropping terminology that we understand what you're talking about. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it's important for people to get somewhat familiarized with occult linguistics. Very important to remember that when it comes to summoning, uh, the benefit of being a human being, is you cannot be summoned. It is something that happens to a being that is extra-dimensional, a being that is a servitor race of an anti-god or a, a demon or an angel, conceivably. You summon ancient gods. These are beings that can be drawn. In other words, it's something that happens against one's will. You get something similar when you're summoned to court. You don't have a choice, at least not theoretically. You have to go or there will be repercussions. Great example was uh, Sean David Morton, who was yeah. continually summoned and never yes. showed up. <laughs> and now he's in jail. <laughs> so uh, so there you have that. And uh, that uh, is not the exact case with these entities. Uh, it's more like the laws of physics when we say, Oh, that's against the law of physics. Is there a punishment for breaking the law of physics? Well, oh, sort of. <laughs> you just got that's one of my lines. I love that. I've, Thank I've you. often said, do I get arrested if I defy the law of gravity? If I is well, there a fine for this? Well, there is. Do in they a sense. summons me into a court? Yeah, there is in a sense. Uh, this is why I tell people about uh, the reality that we deal with on a basis of day to day survival as compared to what I say about magic. When you talk about magic, it makes an analogy with software programming. Uh, basically, it's, our reality is, in many ways, maya or illusion in Absolutely. the Buddhist term. Yes, and because it is so, then we can rewrite the program because it is, in many ways, a WAM, a W-A-M, a write-along memory. That's what spellcasting is. It's simply entering a cheat code into the video game so you can rig the results. Nice. People who dare to do that <laughs> I love it. will be able to do that. Spellcasting is simply a science which is not studied. It's simply an unstudied science because an entire group of people has arisen by design of the elite to deny this ability of yours, of any one of us, to conduct these spells and rewrite the world to serve us. And the elite doesn't want that happening. So what they do is they've created an intelligentsia of academics to say, this is poppycock. This is nonsense. It is. It breaks the laws of physics. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. let's tie this into it, too, because there's an antecedent to uh, the summonings in history, going back uh, to um, Jack Ironside Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard doing the Babylon yes. working yes. ritual, which was to produce the moon child. Yes. And Parsons, the founder of JPL Laboratories, the forerunner of NASA. 
Yes. So, uh, the, and people have wondered about this. I've written articles about this. The the intersection between occult dark arts and military, they're intrinsically li- linked with each other. Yes, very much so. The military occult complex. And yes. as I said, yeah, as I said, just as there is a military industrial complex, it doesn't do it justice. You also have a medical industrial complex, and that mm. complex has worked hand in glove with the military. They've been paid to do radiation experiments on people. People can look these up, the radiation experiments, and they'll find out much of what they need to know. I can provide more information in the future. But what it is, is a military, medical, occult, industrial, education, entertainment, information, (laughs) corporate, congressional (laughs) complex, just about every aspect of your society. One gigantic satanic clusterfuck is what it is. Yes, very much so. And I've uh, provided an acronym, the uh, momanisec.com, which memonanisec.com, which has many of these terms in it, such as nuclear, industrial science, etc. All of it put together. What, what is that website again? Douglas? Oh, douglasdietrich.com. And, no, no, uh, and that's on your site. Yes, yes. Okay. And, and so the people can look at that. They can also go to Facebook. And uh, what I'll do is after uh, we've done this interview, I'll put a post up on it and it'll be there. And I'll ask my web mistress to put that up on the site as well so that people okay. get a better handle of that acronym. But it's fairly all inclusive. It's just about anything you can think of that's societally uh, impacting. And uh, so in this reality, the important thing to remember is you can't take reality for granted, even though it may be Maya or illusion in terms of what you can do with yourself and the realization of your full potential. There are repercussions when you do try to break the laws of physics. No, you don't show up in a court of law, but if you jump off a 40-story building and uh, you're not prepared to fly through some it's occult system. really hurt. Yes, for thank about you. A, for about a, a millisecond. Yeah, yes, yes, that's, that's right. You might have a lot of fun on the way down. And yeah, a lot of I've often thought that you know would the ride down be worth what happens at the bottom and i'm going nah not so much no i don't think so but it all depends right i mean hey uh i i think the best example of that is the slow-mo drug in the 2012 i think dread film and uh and mama getting pushed out of the tower and uh you know yes, i mean exactly. it, yeah in her case it might have been worth it i mean she shows nothing but relief on her face when she hits the ground at the end uh just uh, the freedom from life and down on the way bottom it must have been fairly beautiful <laughs> but uh, the uh we, we don't all have that uh that benefit of uh narcotized uh aid uh no. in, in the meantime uh my, my point being that uh what we do have is a group of elitists who since the time of of course uh john d in the british empire were working on ritual with government uh, approval. Now, of course, that goes all the way back to Moloch, uh, but uh, when we go back to the time of John D, that's our, our state of uh, modernity. That's when modernity begins to develop where you have a state-sponsored sorcerer. And that uh, it kind of climaxes uh, at our point in history with Michael Aquino. So Michael yeah. Aquino couldn't have gotten here without the history of John D, who was the original 007, who signed, signed himself off as 007 for his queen, all the way to Michael Aquino uh, being a member of the military intelligence occult complex that uh, summoned uh, demons and angels in the name of the government. Now, what kind of angels? The angel of death. So a great example of uh, what our dear friend Dawn uh, reminded herself to speak of, uh, a great example of this was uh, one incident where I would work at night, and it's important to put some perspective into this. I was a documents destruction expert, which is not nearly as glamorous as that might sound, and uh, a lot of that had to do with physical destruction of documents. Now, an interesting aspect of my detractors is they make all kinds of claims, and uh, all one needs to do is look up Douglas Dietrich, and the first thing that's going to come up, aside from this preposterous website run by this known pedophile uh, known as John Lillier, who who recently blessed us with his death. And uh, this individual, of course, ran a uh, stupid blog spot called This Ain't Hell, But You Can See It From Here. Now, why that stupid title? Because hell was not yet arisen on Earth 
Yet he and his master, Michael Aquino, wanted to make Earth a hell on Earth. So that's why the title, this ain't hell, but you can see it from here. They were very much expected that the hell would arise in our generation thanks to their provocations. Mm -hmm. And they were working towards that. So hence you've got this satanic blog spot uh, by this pedopornoholic who uh, basically was trying to discredit myself for obvious reasons to the point where if he were simply professional, he would just say, these are the documents. Uh, Douglas Dietrich isn't what he says. But no, he goes into uh, calling me names, uh, saying Douglas Dietrich looks like the half-breed son of Dr. No, who happens to be queer. All this, it just goes in. It's just preposterous. You look at it, you say, this guy is obviously nuts. He obviously has a personal beat. But why would it be so extreme? Because, of course, Aquino's ordering to pull out all the plugs, and they're not professional enough anymore where they can do it in a psyops fashion where it even looks professional. Not even the forgeries. So it gets to the point now where you have that with my other primary stalker, which is, of course, a man named Stephen Outrim, whose net worth is $70 million and was, according to all the people at the Presidium military base, given insider trading dope when he started his corporation Sausage Software, which he ultimately sold short just before the Silicon Valley bubble burst and got a cool $70 million and hasn't done anything since in the software field because everything he did was with Department of Defense aid and assistance. And uh, after that, he wasn't producing anything that civilian men produce who are actually involved with software because he wasn't a creative software producer. Well, he asked me, of course, at one point in my life to have sex with him, and I said no. He offered a million bucks, and I said no. And since then, he wrote a blog about me called Burners in the Man. When you look up Douglas Sausage Secret, Software. Sausage Software, yes. Really? Yes. No, and, uh, no euphemisms there, eh? Oh, no, this individual, yeah, he, uh, when you look up Douglas Dietrich, you'll see his blog spot, and, and please, go through it, keep going through it, and, and you're just going to find out how insane this individual is, I mean, but he'll say things that don't make any sense, he'll say, oh, those, there, there was no incinerator at the Presidio military base, I mean, okay, let's all sit down for a second, a military base, there's no incinerator, oh, really, really, no one incinerates documents on a mil please, really? You know, but that, this is the insanity. Um, I can tell you that they do, and here's how I can tell you. Thank you. In the 90s, I worked in document management. Thank you. I live in an area that's loaded with bases. I saw the contracts that were issued for things like microfilm shredders, Thank paper you. shredders, and high-temperature incineration devices. Bless you. Thank you so much. And it's just common sense. Aside from Randy Malgin's personal experience, eyewitness experience, professional experience, for, uh, uh, for what that's worth, really, uh, what more do you need? Uh, well, what you need is some common sense. And it's amazing what people are willing to believe. It's basically people who don't want to hear what I have to say are willing to believe that level of insanity. Uh, it just it goes against all common sense. And so <laughs> when people see this, this has to be brought up so people don't fall prey to that level of propaganda. So in terms of the incinerator, I was working with the incinerator one night, and what happened was uh, the room went dark. And people say, well, do you mean the lights went out? No, there wasn't a blackout. There wasn't no flicker, and then suddenly the room went dark. I mean, everything went black. Not only did everything go black, everything went cold. Now, I'm in front of the incinerator. I'm putting in a uh, very cold. Oh, pause yeah. there for a minute. It Thank went you. cold. Yes. So yes. we know, okay, so um, my background tells me that that's a pretty sure sign that the dark one has entered. Yes. Yes. And what was going on was that evening, Michael Aquino had come in with his uh, cohorts, and these are members of his coven, none of them below the level of a uh, of a fairly high-ranking officer. I would say that these were, uh, no one was beneath the rank of major. And, and Aquino uh, himself held what, held, at, at what, at what, as, what was Aquino's rank? What, what did he achieve? Aquino's rank until he retired as a full bird colonel, which was the highest he could get because he couldn't get any higher rank than that because of the controversy with the general public. Right. His rank was colonel. At the time that I worked with him, at the time that he did all his damage, it was lieutenant colonel. But it's here's the difference. It would be like a military doctor. If you've got an MD who's a product of a military school like Letterman Army Medical Center, which trained 25% of all U.S. Army 
doctors. That MD on the field of battle, uh, when it comes to a medical issue, where that MD suddenly is brought into a general at the command center, and yes. the general is saying, I feel tired, I want you to give me some more of that, that amphetamine. I want you to give me some more of that amphetamine to keep me working through this battle. And then that MD looks at him and says, sir, I've given you so much of this, uh, not only will the next dose be fatal, you will not be in a proper frame of mind to make any decisions. I hereby, as a medical doctor, order you to stand down for the sake of our operation, operational effectiveness. Now, that MD theoretically has to be obeyed. It doesn't matter. His rank is lower than the general. What he says will override the general. And right. that's what Aquino was like as a lieutenant colonel in terms okay. of occult affairs. It doesn't matter that he was a lieutenant colonel. When he was dealing with men who were in his coven, who were the rank of general, who were the rank of major, they had to listen to what he said because he had that power that was surrendered to, respected, uh, acknowledged as the specialist. So he was the occult version of the MD. He wrote the chaplain's handbook for all services, all services. That includes Navy, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, all of that was under the chaplain's handbook of Michael Aquino, which he wrote. And so all that handbook that was written by Michael Aquino was written so that all other chaplains, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, whatever they were, they would have to step down and stand back whenever a satanic chaplain showed up. So he had ultimate authority as the man who wrote the chaplain's handbook as the spiritual advisor to all branches of service. That's why people met him on Air Force bases, in Navy bases. He was in all kinds of bases that weren't Army bases. And people would ask me, what the hell was Aquino doing there? He's Army. He's the satanic chaplain. He has asked as a spiritual advisor on the occult to all bases. He wrote the chaplain's handbook for all chaplains of all services. So this was the power of this individual. And because he had international security clearance, he would ask for occult grimoires. That's the old name for grammar, which means a spell book, like spelling. Words cast spells. They can alter your mind. They can cop it. They can start wars. They can cause riots. This is why it's called spelling. That's where the term comes from. So when you're spell casting, you use a grammar, a grimoire. So ancient grimoires, some written on human skin, some written in human blood, some bound in the skins of babies. These were books that were kept in museums, under safes, in refrigerated safekeeping, in academies, archaeology departments, all over the world, in Canada, South Africa, various places of the Commonwealth where the British Empire had raided India and other empires like China for over a hundred years. These books would be ordered by Michael Aquino in exchange program through the interlibrary loan program, uh, where libraries were considered without walls. And I, of course, uh, was responsible for ordering these books, and they would be brought as if they were museum pieces, which they were, like fine china or porcelain, by couriers. The couriers would uh, deliver them to the Presidio Military Ballet's library, but because they were on library loan, interlibrary loan, Aquino couldn't take them home. It was against the regulations. They had to stay at the library under refrigerated safekeeping so they wouldn't deteriorate as they would in a home environment at room temperature. So Aquino had to maintain them there for maintaining the integrity of the item, if nothing else. And so they were kept there, and so his spell casting was done there. That's why his summonings were done there. Now, the U.S. military had seen him in action in Vietnam, where he wrote the book The Diabolicon. His original Diabolicon, in which he summoned no less than a dozen devils and daemons, including Beelzebub and including Diabolus Lucifer himself. All of these came to speak to him. And when he channeled them to write the Diabolicon, he was able to make that part of the military program to make and break the morale of the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong during attacks. So when fire bases were being attacked, the Americans said, look, we're doing things like sending helicopters overhead, blaring loud music like screams, uh, children and animals being slaughtered, all being replayed like they did at Waco. They would try and play that using helicopter uh, sound systems overhead the Vietnamese 
and the Vietnamese would, of course, shoot the helicopters down. Well, that cost a lot of manpower, uh, even more so. It was expensive in terms of helicopters and stereo equipment. So they said, well, we hear, Kino, that you can summon demons and do this for us on the cheap. Can you do this free? And can you make this happen without a budget? I most certainly can. And so he summoned these demons, wrote the Diabolicon, and then when they called him into the field when a firebase was under siege, he would summon the screams of the underworld itself. People would hear the sounds of diabolic agony, and the Vietnamese would not only be terrified, the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese Army units, the force of the sound was like a sonic shockwave. They'd be thrown back several yards. They'd see them fly through the air as if they were kicked by an invisible projectile that had hit them and forced their bodies back as a unit with these satanic screams that emerged out of nowhere, coming out of nowhere and everywhere at once. And thus did Aquino prove his value to the point where his own base was attacked by the Vietnamese as a priority target so they could destroy the Diabolicon. The copy, which he channeled and wrote in Vietnam, was kept in a refrigerated safe on site the Presidio at the military base library, where I myself was in charge of his care keeping. And it was burnt and had bullet holes in it. That's how close the Vietnamese got to destroying it. That's how important they considered it. And, of course, uh, that is something that has even given Randy Maugans a flashback. He's already had an image of... Yeah. 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 The, you just uh, I, as you were talking, I, I was I was getting flash images of the shit. That's um, how real it is, and you know it's real. You yeah, know it because of people real. you've spoken with, and many yeah. of them through your military relations, and all of this made Aquino a hero in the eyes of the U.S. military. They said this man can deliver, and because of that, they turned to him again and again. You wouldn't believe. Some of the things that I learned from him, uh, basically, when it came to elements like uh, the original, uh, just a short segue here, because I believe it's important for people to understand this. When the Third Reich originally came into power, one of the things that Adolf Hitler set into effect was a euthanasia program for children who were mentally challenged or mm. developmentally disabled. That stopped fairly quickly. What caused it? Public outrage in the Third Reich? Give me a break. What happened was that a man named Aleister Crowley confronted uh, yes. Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini and offered his services. Well, Aleister Crowley was an agent of the British yes. intelligence. And, of course, people can find this laid That's out. well documented. Yes. yes, with books like Agent 666, etc. Basically an MI6 operation. Thank you. Thank you, which is their version of foreign intelligence, their version of the CIA. Yeah. And uh, so what happened was that uh, when he offered his services, it wasn't long before Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini uh, expelled them from their nations. People who try and say, oh, Adolf Hitler was cooperating with uh, Aleister Crowley are entirely ignorant of the reality of the situation. What happened was... Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler of the SS, the Schutzstaffel, which transliterates into security service, presented Adolf Hitler with evidence that Aleister Crowley was a British agent and that it had best be uh, cancelled any programs that had been suggested by Aleister Crowley. It was Aleister Crowley that originally suggested the euthanasia program. And what Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler, of all people, presented Adolf Hitler was here is why Aleister Crowley wants to destroy the developmentally disabled. I found out why from Michael Aquino. Now, on my own birthday, on October 20th, back in the years just shortly before German reunification in 1989, Michael Aquino went to Wevelsburg Castle, the old SS castle in Germany. He did this to conduct a ritual. Many people think it's some kind of neo-Nazism. Nothing could be further from the truth. In terms of the uh, book that was written by H.P. Lovecraft, the only book that was published in his mm. lifetime, a novella, one of the things that he uh, speaks of 
in the, um, oh God, it was the uh, book that was about the fish people, essentially the survivors of the Cthulhu. sunken continent of Mu. Well, that Cthulhu was in a short story called The Call okay. of Cthulhu. But in this other novella that was published during his lifetime, people can look it up, uh, what happened was that it he... wasn't the Necronomicon, was it? No, the Necronomicon okay. he wrote of, but okay. uh, he didn't write the book itself. In terms of uh, this book, it was either the horror at Red Hook. They all have these lurid pulp titles. It's yeah, very yeah. difficult for me to remember them. Uh, I, I believe Shadow Over Innsmouth. In the, the in the novella, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, there's a drunken character in there, and his name is Zadok. Zadok is asked, yes, yes yeah. what yeah. can what can hold the L anti gods at bay? What is it that we can use to ward them off? He said, the swastika. Only the swastika can ward off the anti-gods. Uh, and this is why the Hockenkreutz, the Hooked Cross, was adopted by the National an ancient, Socialist. If that's a, actually an ancient Hindu symbol, symbol, correct? It's a universal symbol from all ancient civilizations other than Semitic. Any civilization, the Native Americans had oh, the swastika. Any civilization other than Semitic civilizations had the swastika as a ward against the anti-gods. This is why the National Socialists adopted it as a shield against American cultism. And when Adolf Hitler, as a carrier of that shield, that was the symbol that appeared in the sky to Constantine when he was told ah, by God yes, himself, by under this sign I shall conquer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that became the symbol of the Roman legions. And, of course, it's the Roman salute, the adlocutio, the Heil Hitler, that was used by the fascist eye for that very reason. Now, all of this is important because one of the things that Heinrich Himmler proved, and that's what uh, our man Aquino, uh, to use a pun, I'm not saying that out of respect, but out of contempt, this is why he told me he hated, quote-unquote, retard so much. He hmm. said, Douglas, you ever know why retarded people are kept in charities, why anyone bothers to keep them around? And uh, he said, basically, you've got a situation where kings have kept them around even in the ancient days. And, uh, and here's why, he explained to me. They have a purity. They're incorruptible. Mm -hmm. They serve as a ward against the diabolism that we call forth. The dark energies and fallen angels we call upon can't enter a room or an estate where one is living. And ultimately, this is why Adolf Hitler stopped the euthanasia program that had been suggested by wow. Aleister Crowley. Wow. And uh, once it was discovered, these serve as a kind of shield when they're around a specific area. That area becomes almost protected from the majority of occult attacks. Well, most people don't keep a developmentally disabled person around. I know that Don Hamhart knows that in her heart, and that's why this confirms why these people have always been something that warms our hearts. These are why developmentally disabled people, truly those spiritually developed among us, sense that and know why it's so important to mm -hmm. preserve them mm -hmm. and to nurture them. So with these kind of victims that were targeted by Michael Aquino, when the military would say, can you assassinate this person for us? One night when I was working on the incinerator and the whole place went black and cold and I lost all sense of love for my relations in the world, when I went out to where Michael Aquino and his coven were, everything had turned. In the darkness, I could sense this. Where he had stood before, where he was leading the chorus in the summoning, all the men were on the opposite end of the room. Their voices had changed. He spoke with the voice of a dozen men, while a dozen men spoke in his single voice. It's as if they switched places. I knew they had not done so, because you cannot do so during a summoning, or you will break the circle. If you do that, you're inviting death and damnation. I knew their voices had switched while their bodies had not. I could hear that in the dark. I couldn't see anything because the flashlight I had in my hand was useless. It couldn't penetrate the total black. In other words, the black absorbed all light. Truly, the darkness had entered the room. And in the center was a wax hand to represent the hand of death, a hand sculpted to the exact fingerprints in the wax, of their intended victim. After the ritual was conducted and the lights came back on, meaning the darkness left the room, the lights had never gone out, when the light had vacated the room and the hand was still there, the wax was melted. They received a phone call from a man watching the estate of the victim from the other side of the street. 
and he confirmed, yes, they're calling an ambulance. The man has had a heart attack and died. They're calling the angel of death has succeeded. Where my hair turned completely white was when a bunch of these drunken buffoons, without Aquino's supervision, decided they were going to summon one of the most powerful entities of the inventory of angels and demons when they wanted to be able to improve their ability to shoot in the dark. This was sophomoric. They took M16s kept in the local armory, some of the original M16s ever made, which had wooden stocks. And these were the kind that were issued with G.I. Joe because it was Mattel Corporation that had been contracted to build the M16. Of it was, yes. And Hence the M. Yes. Right there. Yeah. Thank you. And they were taking these wooden stock, actual Mattel-built prototypes of the M16. They carved the Star of Baphomet, the inverted pentagram into it, and, of course, created a circle in their own blood in a drunken night when a dozen men were together and a 13th was called upon in order to make their circle complete. Since they had only 12, they wrote my name into their agenda. I was not asked permission for this. And while I was working on the incinerator that night, and everything went cold and black again, and I walked outside into the playground, which the library was on the property of, near the playground, on grounds the playground, at the other end of the playground, a football field away, we had a set of swings that they had set up mannequins of children upon so they could hang them. You can't do that with an adult mannequin with any convenience. So they took the child mannequins, had hung them, up on the swings at the other end, a football field away, and they were firing their M16s in the dark and hitting with every hit. And when I interrupted them, they turned around and their eyes were all aglow in the dark, the same kind of glow you see from a predatory animal like a wolf, which reflects all of the ambient light through its eye c cubes, the cones, the eye cones, mm -hmm. which we have within it that can absorb that light if we have that kind of genetics. Humans don't have that. They asked me, what had happened to my eyes? And I said, well, what's happened to yours? And they said, well, we've summoned Malek Taos, the peacock angel, so that we could hit these targets in the dark. And I said, well, we're going to have to exercise him. We're all possessed now. And they said, how can that be? They're laughing drunkenly. And I pointed to their circle of blood and said, look here, right by the basketball shoot where you people would otherwise be hitting air balls, uh, you've got this circle that's broken. There was no containment for what you summoned. We had an occult Chernobyl. All animal sounds had stopped in area, not even insects. So what happened was we went back yeah. to the library. We prayed and we prayed until we felt the spirit leave us. It's never fully gone. Something has fully been missing from myself ever since. A pleasant memory, a happy moment from childhood, and in its place forever, a piece of that entity is always with me. That night I came home, my hair entirely white, and in terms of my eyes, even my irises were black for weeks. And the end result, of course, has been that I've had to grow comfortable with that entity. That entity is, of course, no mere demon, and certainly no angel. It's in between. Malik Taos, the peacock angel, was Lucifer fall to earth. When he fell on earth, he had to have allies that would support him. He made a pact with the first people who encountered him, the Yazidi of northern Syria and Iraq. Mm -hmm. And the Yazidi people became his people. They are known to this day as Satanists or the worshippers of the peacock angel. People persecute them. ISIS tried to annihilate them. It's for that reason Michael Aquino felt I might be open to a ritual that would assassinate myself. He felt that maybe Malik Taos has abandoned the Yazidi, and if so, he's abandoned Douglas Dietrich. That's why John Lillier committed himself to a spellcasting that ultimately took his life. This was done on the July 26th, period of time, just last month, it failed miserably because Malik Taz has never abandoned myself. I feel him like a worn leather glove on myself, about me, and like a junkyard dog, anyone who violates his territory or attempts to will be eviscerated. 
This is why John Victor Lillier, so-called Master Sergeant from the Green Berets, the man who forged documents to denounce veterans so they wouldn't get benefits, that would often drive them to suicide, in that sense, the indirect murderer or the direct mm. murderer of mm. dozens, scores of men. Yeah. This is how he went out in terror, pain, and fear, and eternal damnation. This is what people need to understand. This is why I've never taken on a sorcerer's apprentice. I've had people approach me over the years begging for me to teach them these spells. Of course I haven't done so and never would. I never will. I will take on no apprentices. I want people to know that when you play with magic at the highest levels, damnation awaits if you make a mistake. You also want to commit yourself to doing works with positive intent. If you do what Aquino does, it's beyond risking your soul. You're risking that of everyone around you. I was simply a collateral damage victim of what happened that night of the Broken Circle. And since that period of time, I've been left physically scarred to the point where I've had to dye my hair artificially to maintain the sense of darkness that I once had in the follicles of my scalp. And since that period of time, I've been scarred in terms of my soul. But at the same time, I've gotten a greater understanding of our cosmology. We have to remember the demons and devils serve a purpose. They're here because without them, man could not prove that he was worthy of salvation. They're here so we can exercise free will. God yes. allowed Lucifer to fall for a reason. Those devils and demons are the same reason we have dung beetles, earthworms, all that you don't see underground operates so you can see the blossoms and the flowers above. Without that composting, you would have none of the gardens that capture your soul with the beauty of the heavens. But without those devils and demons, you wouldn't have that. Respect them, understand them, in a sense even admire them. But whatever you do, that doesn't mean you can casually play with them. You leave that to the experts. And even the experts, the priests of the church, can become corrupted. That's what happens. So take my word for it. In Africa, where I served on mercenary contract, the Africans have a very different view of the world in which they interact with at a survival level, a subsistence level. They view a demon as someone who can potentially be a friend and an ally. It shows you there's different perspectives on these forces. Yeah, this kind of goes as well over into the, the jinn lore as well. Very much so. But remember, this is not for your average person. This no. doesn't mean that children should be encouraged to follow this path. Understand it's there. Understand some people might ultimately be able to handle it. Most cannot. Most of them will be corrupted and turn into criminals. Most of them will become the spiritual version thereof, like D'Angelo the serial killer, the man who terrorized California, or Richard Ramirez, who never had a chance. People like this are victims as well as victimizers. Does that mean they're someone to be pitied? At that point, they're a force that's out of control. You respond to them with deadly force. I, of course, haven't degenerated to that level. The reason I haven't is because Malak Taos isn't a devil or a demon per se. It's important to realize he's the link in between heaven and hell. He's what makes Earth, Earth itself, a separate realm. Malkuth, mm -hmm. the material kingdom. So I am of this world. Malik Taos is a guardian of this world. His people, the Yazidi, are of this world. And the reason Aquino hated them so much, the reason he was willing, along with General Vanelli, the man who co-wrote Mind War, the book with Michael Aquino, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on waging non-stop psychological warfare, this is why General Vanelli himself admitted to forming ISIS. They wanted to exterminate the Yazidi people because they wanted to eliminate that link of Malik Taos with the world. If they can kill off the Yazidi, Malik Taz has no human tether, no mortal embodiments of his essence. If that is gone, all of us die. Heaven and hell become what should be separate from the earth. The elements combine, and like antimatter meeting matter itself, everything ends. 
it is the Yazidi people we must treasure and protect at all costs. Their annihilation was prevented because of the guardianship of Malik Taos and ISIS wit and retreat. In that sense, of course the Russians and Vladimir Putin did the will of God. And in other senses, Vladimir Putin and the Russians must be resisted. All of this is the adult world, the adult cosmology of reality. We have to understand it's not just black and white, it's a million shades of gray. Thank you.